Welcome everybody to the lock-in. It's Friday night. It's where we gather every Friday to chat about Irish whiskey, to come together and raise a glass to one another, to our health, hopefully, and uh, meet and hang out with like-minded people who love Ireland and love Irish whiskey. Tonight, I'm really excited about the program we have ahead of us. Uh, it, tonight is all about wood, wood and more wood, maturation and a really important part of whiskey production. I'm excited that we've got uh, an expert uh, joining us to talk all about wood. So it's going to be a really great night. You might see a very unusual whiskey here for the first time or one of the first times. We're, we, we have a scotch and not an Irish whiskey uh, as one of the whiskeys being featured. And there's a good reason for that. So stay tuned over the next uh, nine or 10 hours of chat and crack as we talk about wood, more wood and more whiskey. Welcome everybody to Friday night and welcome to the lock-in. Welcome as always. It's great to see so many familiar faces already commenting and joining in. I'd love to know where you are, where are you joining us from, where in the world are you tonight, and more importantly, most importantly, what are you drinking? Uh, I hope you're all healthy, I hope you're all safe, uh, and I hope you're all keeping well in these unusual times. Uh, I was only chatting uh, a moment ago with uh, with Mark, uh, Mark Quick, our guest who will be joining us shortly from uh, Nathan Whiskey distillery in Cooperage about how it's almost a year now since we started the lock-ins and it was originally started just to I guess have a, a chat around the time when the pubs closed in Ireland around St. Patrick's Day last year and it's almost a year later and we're still here almost every Friday night bar one or two throughout the year but we've been doing this now for almost a whole year which is astonishing and uh, in some ways it's a thing to celebrate that we come together every Friday night and in other ways it's a it's sad that uh, we had to create this and that we had to find community in other ways, but you do what you can in tough times and when you have no other option, um, this is as good as maybe we can do for the moment. But uh, that this live stream lock-in will continue post-pandemic and even when we can meet in person, we'll find ways to incorporate this into in-person live events as well. So you're all very welcome again to Friday night. Let us know what's in your glass. Great to see so many of you. Alan Cullen is joining us with Redbreast 19 year old. Good man, Alan. Darren has got powers the distillers cut in rugby in the UK. Great man. Johnny McNally drinking Johnny's Lane in Long Beach, New York. Good man, Johnny. Chad Miller has got some Redbreast 12 year old in Bismarck, North Dakota. We don't hear from many people in Bismarck, North Dakota. Chad, you're very welcome. Aaron is joining us from Brooklyn. Hi, Aaron. You're very welcome. Brandon is drinking Powers in Maine. Connor is drinking Glendalock 13 Mizanara. That'll feature later on as well. Our guest Mark has a bottle of that on standby as well. Tonight is all about uh, wood, as I mentioned, and it's a fascinating aspect of whiskey production and something that uh, I think uh, my knowledge of it could be written on the back of a postage stamp, which is why I bring experts on to help me understand and learn about the various aspects of whiskey production. And it's so detailed, it's so nuanced, and it's so fascinating because the art of making barrels, repairing barrels, using casks for maturation is something as old as whiskey itself almost. And uh, there's so much to it and there's so much nuance and detail. And we all drink whiskies that have spent time in a wooden barrel. And in many cases, many different types of barrels and casks and different finishes. And so we're going to spend the evening tonight looking into all of those, examining them, talking about them, enjoying those whiskies and learning about them. At the same time, going behind the scenes and learning about uh, the great work that they're doing uh, at Nathan uh, with the distillery and the distillery that's in construction and the Cooperage. So we'll be going in about a minute or two to Mark Quick, who will join us all the way from the West, the West of Ireland for tonight's show. What else are you drinking? Let me have a look. Simon Andrews in Waterford drinking W.D. O'Connell. Good man. 12-year-old. Fair play. Martin Hilliard is in California. Not too far from me with Napo 12-year-old. Great stuff. You see, already I can see from the whiskies that you're drinking the different wood types and the different finishes that you're already enjoying and we'll talk about those peter galbraith in dublin good man thanks for joining us frank gilday 
sipping on 12 year old red breast in jupiter florida michael cully enjoying some aru kesh Corin, never had it how is that michael Tyler doesn't have any of tonight's whiskeys, but he's sipping on Powers Three Swallow. A great drop, a great drop. Tullamore Dew, 14-year-old for Greg Anderson. Before we bring on uh, our special guest this evening for our night talking about wood, uh, I want to let you know that we have a contest running at the moment. And we are giving away, believe it or not, a bottle of Redbreast 21-year-old. And we're giving a bottle of Redbreast 21-year-old away uh, in a drawing this time next week. So on the lock-in next week, I'm going to do a drawing. And it is a drawing from everybody who has purchased for themselves a set of Tua glasses, green Tua glasses, a world exclusive. We released green Tua glasses to our Facebook group, Irish Whiskey Fans of America, just two short weeks ago. And we sold uh, more than 500 of them in the space of about a day. And uh, we ordered a second batch of them from the factory in Europe, which are being produced at the moment. And we'll continue to sell those until they sell out. So we're pre-selling them right now. They'll arrive uh, in California in the next couple of weeks. And then I'll be shipping them out. So they're for St. Patrick's Day. And it's the world's first green to a glass. And they're available in sets of two or four. And everybody who purchases, whether they purchase a set of two or a set of four, gets entered into a draw to win a bottle of Redbreast 21. Uh, where do you get, you have to be, uh, the only caveat here for our European uh, viewers is that you must be resident in the United States of America to be able to chance to win this bottle of Redbreast 21 year old. How do you purchase these green tour glasses? I hear you scream loudly at me. You can go to storiesandsips.com and click on the shop. In the top right hand corner, you'll see a button that says shop and there you'll find the green tour glasses available. Um, and they are unique. They're, it's the first time they've ever been produced and they're available exclusively to us at the moment. So uh, everybody who buys those is entered into a draw for Redbreast 21. And thank you to everybody who has supported us so far with um, their purchases. Dave Cummins uh, from Dingle Distillery joining us. How are you doing? Good to see you, Dave. Dana's got Wacky Rum Cask Tully. Lovely. I like a drop of that. Good stuff. And James Lynch has got uh, Paddy in his glass, and he's moving on to JJ Curry. So we have a great selection of whiskeys, all of which have spent time in wooden casks, of course. And uh, how else would they become whiskey? So without further ado, why don't we bring on our special guest for this evening, Mr. Mark Quick from Nathan Whiskey Distillery in Cooperage. Mark, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Delighted to be here, Barry. All the way from the west of Ireland. It can't be pronounced without an extra couple of H's in there. Yeah, three H's is mandatory once you cross the Shannon. <laughs> Uh, that takes a bit of getting used to, all right? If you're not from the West or you're not from Ireland, you wouldn't know that that's what differentiates a local from a tourist. No, exactly, exactly. And we're only, we're only chatting about how Nathan might be pronounced Nefin in certain pa parts of the world, but uh, you know, you're you're with somebody from the West of Ireland or somebody in the know if they pronounce it nice and softly, and it's a Nathan. When you were when we were chatting before we came on, and you mentioned Nathan, uh, I will admit that I had in my head been calling it Nathan all the time, and that's showing my lack of not being from, showing that I'm from Cork and not from the West. I'm from the South. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll forgive you the first time, uh, Barry. The second time now, it'll it'll be Mark. That's fair. That's fair, yeah. Mark. Um, you run a remarkable business and uh, and i was delighted when we connected recently uh and you introduced me to uh your most recent whiskey release and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second because it's sitting up here but you run a remarkable business uh, a, a cooperage uh construction of a distillery um we're going to go into detail on, on all aspects of this but i'm most curious to begin with how does somebody get into that business? Is that something you went to school to learn about, to study? How does somebody end up in a in a, a coopering and distilling business? Um, largely by largely by accident, really. Um, my my background was in software. Um, I was I was an engineer, um, and uh, I was in a software company uh, which I had founded, and um, you know we were in the business and uh, eventually exited uh, sold that company and i was at a loose end then afterwards and so um 
was uh, looking around at what I might do next. And uh, a, a guy I, I knew called Paul Davis, uh, who was uh, a, a lecturer in DCU, invited me down to Lahardon in County Mayo. And Lahardon in County Mayo is a tiny little village um, in the exact geographic Mayo. Um, if you look at a map of Mayo and put your finger in the middle, you, you probably got it. Um, it's just at the foot of Nathan Mountain and on the shores of Loch Conn. Um, and so it was an unusual uh, place for somebody who I would have associated with D Dublin to invite me down to. Um, it's also the, where my grandmother was from. So I knew it well, of course, and uh, there's Nathan now. Um, it's the Eagle Mountain in Ireland. I'm, uh, I'm confident of, of that fact, I think. The tallest um, standalone mountain in Ireland, is it? Yeah, it's not part of a range, so it's it's on, out on its own, and it's the tallest of, of those, I believe. Um, second tallest point in Mayo. And I love that. Stri I love that claim there. That uh, such uh, such confidence. You you can't say you know not worried at all that it's not the tallest mountain, but it's the tallest standalone mountain. Like what a qualifier! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you look if you look hard enough, you can always come up with a good fact uh, for it. <laughs> but uh, lovely climb actually, and uh, recently uh, they've put in a nice trailhead um, up the mountain. Um, so there's a lovely walk up the side of the mountain, and once you get to the top, you're looking out over Loch Conn, and um, the reverse of that view, I suppose. Um, and so you can see, you can see up to Donegal. Um, Long trip. You can see down as far as uh, Connemara and out over the islands, um, you know, Ackle Island, out across all the west uh, coastline. And gorgeous, gorgeous view. If, you ever, if you're ever over this part of the world and get a chance to, to climb it, I'd recommend it. We all, we all need to say that we've climbed the tallest standalone mountain um, because you know, we may have, I've climbed Caron Tool, but I've never climbed the tallest standalone mountain. Ah, uh, you haven't lived, sorry, you haven't lived. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Paul invited me down to, to Lahardon anyway, and it turns out he had a, a kind of a getaway house from, from Dublin down there. And um, I said, well, I, I haven't been in Lahardon in years. Of course, I have plenty of relations down there because my, my grandmother's family was all from, from the area. So... Um, so I took a trip down anyway, and he had a, he had an idea to build a whiskey distillery. And so, um, you know, I said, have we got, have we got a site? No. Have we got uh, any sort of buildings or anything like that? Not yet. No. Have we any funding to do any of this? No, no. So that's where we started really. And, uh, you know, we, we, we started bit by bit to build out um, Nathan, Nathan Distillery then um, from there. Uh, the name was kind of obvious enough. Um, you know, that that was probably the fastest uh, meeting and the, the quickest decision we ever made. It kind of, it's right at the foot of Nathan Mountain. It kind of had to be called Nathan Whiskey. Um, so that's, that's where it started, uh, really. And then <clears throat> as we started uh, developing, you know, wh what we wanted to do, the concept was to use really local uh, ingredients. Um, so we started, bit, you know, bit by bit, getting farmers in the area involved in in growing barley, um, which was, you know, something that used to happen a lot more. Because I'm I'm from about twenty miles away from Lahardon, the other side of Loch Conn, and so you know, back in the late eighties, early nineties, we would have been growing barley, um, and then, you know, it kind of, um, I suppose the 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 grain price really made it kind of uneconomical to do it in our area. Um, the yields would be slightly lower in the West because we don't get as much sunshine, um, which is no problem for the barley, um, but it's a problem for, you know, uh, the economics of barley, if you're with me. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of something that we had to kind of work with all of the local farmers to kind of, you um, you know, get back that get back that uh, skill set and that attention to to growing barley, which is a lot different, of course, than than growing, we'd say, grassland or, um, uh, so, uh, we started that, you know, way back in twenty fifteen. Now it's it's hard to believe it's twenty twenty one, but, 
Uh, we started doing that and we've done four four seasons of barley um, since. Um, so it was kind of one aspect, you know, and it's quite an ambitious vision, of course, because like, um, you know, the next thing we started to do, as well as growing barley locally, we wanted to use the, you know, we're surrounded by bog land. So as you look at Nathan Mountain, anything to the east is, uh, you know, kind of uh, farmlands and mostly to the west and the north is absolutely covered in bog lands from there as far as the cage of fields. Um, so we kind of, again, it was kind of self-evident to us that we needed to use this, um, you know, as part as part of the whiskey that we wanted to create. Um, and so, you know, we said we better build a, we better build a malt house then to use the term. First we're finished, we better have a cooperage then to make the to make the casks. Um, so. It, it was an ambitious vision, and I suppose at the time we thought we might do it a bit quicker, um, but we're still we're still going anyway, and still still getting there. Did you not know you could have outsourced all those bits, and you could have brought together outsourced barley production and coopering and malting, and that the rudders doing all those bits for you? You decided no, we should do all of that. Um, it's one thing having a dream, but uh, it's another thing having this kind of mad idea, isn't it? It is, it is. And we could have skipped the whole lot and uh, just drank some of the nice Irish whiskies that came out since, uh, as it turned out. But back in 2014, it wasn't the same landscape at all, um, really. I'm not sure how many operational distilleries there were, but I would guess um, certainly single digits. Um, you know, Dingle, Dingle was operating. Um, yep. Teeling, you know, but it wasn't it wasn't the same landscape as as you see in in twenty twenty one, um for sure. With I'm, I'm not sure where the numbers are now, but but a lot of operational distilleries. Thirty eight, I think now thirty six or thirty eight, yeah, which is yeah. astonishing. So back when you started it, though, yeah, the landscape was a lot uh, thinner on the ground, and yeah, there, there weren't as many opportunities to find providers and vendors and partners. I suppose so. You yeah. had to sell yourselves. And yeah, but as a as a sort of a, as a drinker of, of Irish whiskey, it's a it's a great time to be living through, really. You know, with is, all, of yeah. the, all of the new availabilities of of uh, really nice whiskies to 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 choose from. You know, um, so yeah, I mean that was partly it, but as well as that, you know, we really wanted to bring this uh, local this local peat to bear on on the whiskey. You know, we call it turf, of course. Uh, not yeah. not peat, but in the in the world of whiskey, um, you know, more commonly more commonly peat. But we 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 really had that uh, vision to bring the local ingredients together and bring that turf back into Irish whiskey because, you know, going back to a uh, couple of hundred years, the absolutely only fuel source for dry in the barley was turf in the area you know um actually you don't even have to go back that that far and it's still it's still the most common fuel used um in in the area but um it was all of the uh, historical records that we've that we've come up with uh, since from from that area you know the style of irish whiskey was absolutely um you know peated as, as yeah. you call it. that's something that's not um talked about a lot we the, the scots tend to get credit for peated whiskey but we, we forget that the west of ireland which would have been slow certainly to would have been the last to receive electrification wouldn't they as well uh, in terms of new yeah. energy new, new sources of, of energy turf was what heated you fed you uh, gave you your whiskey everything yeah yeah we're kind of the last to receive everything down west but uh that i think that makes us uh the innovative uh sort of uh people people that we are in mayo you know um so i, I read this I, lovely line like you, you have a lovely line on your or a paragraph on your website as i was getting ready for our chat you have this very romantic beautiful poetic description of what your vision is it says nathan whiskey's vision is to create authentically made peated single malts in a small village in the west of ireland using nathan mountain water locally grown barley locally cut turf then triple distilled in traditional copper pot stills and matured in unique casks handcrafted in nathan cooperage a hollywood director would have dismissed would have dismissed that as being too uh too irish almost 
how could that possibly be true? You're doing it all like in one place. Like I can't get my head past all of that from the resources that you're sourcing locally to the production methods all in one small area. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I'll tell you a, a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to to bring that, to bring that uh, vision to 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 life for sure. You know, um, yeah. that's still exactly the same vision. You know, we haven't uh, we haven't really deviated from that. Um, you know, even even though it's still a work in progress, we're in the final yards of of kind of making that a, a reality now. So let's let's talk like whiskey. Obviously, is a, a patient person's game. Not only the maturation side of things, but getting to the point of being able to distill can take years and years. Um, as so many have found out, it's not something that you can make a quick buck on. As you've been waiting, we'll talk about the distillery a little bit later on. But as you've been waiting for the distillery to come online, you've not turned to the sources of revenue that other distilleries may have turned to, like. Let's produce a gin. Let's produce a vodka. Let's sell something else. Rather, you focused on the cooperage aspect, which is what I'm really interested in. I wonder if you could talk about how this aspect of barrel making and repairing turned into what seems to be a business of its own. Yeah, um, it, it was it was purely a, a guy I knew um, down in Kilbegan, and uh, I've been in touch with him you know, on and off um, during the years, you know, we, we got on quite well just as people. And he was uh, Master Cooper, John Niley. And so John's story is that he was a, a Scotsman uh, born and bred in Glasgow. And um, at age 15, his father was a Cooper. Um, and he was brought along to the to the cooperage where his father worked and he signed uh, what's called his indenture papers and so your indenture papers were the start of your apprenticeship um, as, as a cooper and so you served your time and um, then for the next four years as a as an apprentice and so John served in the cooperage where, where his dad was and his grandfather before him and um, so uh, around the kind of uh, early 90s, um, John Teeling uh, got in touch with John and br you know brought him over to Ireland to work in, in what John Teeling was doing then, which was really like the, the birth of, you know, the start of the renaissance of, of what we're living through right now, really. I mean, um, I, I, think, I think that Middleton and Bushmills were the only operational distilleries at that time. Um, and so John Teeling was setting off on his own adventure at that time and brought brought John over from Scotland as, you know, the, the expertise, importing the expertise in, 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 um, in the wood and the maturation end of, of his venture. So yeah, John ended up in Ireland, settled in Kilbegan, um, you know, brought his, brought his wife and his, um, his child was then Lisa was born in Ireland and really settled into the life of uh, the Midlands town, you know, in Kilbegan. And so, a lot of people would remember him from the Cooperage in in Kilbegan, um, you know, because it was uh, accessible for people who were coming through touring Kilbegan as well. So, John was a great character, you know, uh, no better man to have a word with whoever was passing and kind of bring them in and show them what he was doing um, and what he was working on. So I knew John from, from that time and um, uh, Teeling, then John, um, sold the business to um, Jim Beam and subsequently Suntory. Um, so there was changes at Kilbegan and uh, so, so John left uh, Kilbegan Distillery which, you know, I thought was, a, this was maybe 2014. I thought it was a very odd time in Irish whiskey just at the start of what we could see at that time as an explosion in Irish whiskey coming up that, you know, we were going to have a master cooper who was going to go into retirement um, without training the next generation of coopers in the craft So So I went down and met with John and uh, said, this can't be, this can't be right, you know, uh, what would you think about uh, joining us? And so it was still pretty conceptual, you know, 
um, at that stage. But uh, so John jumped at the chance anyway. Told him what we were trying to do. Um, you know what what we were trying to build out here, and that we really wanted the next generation of of Coopers to learn the craft and the skills, um, the, and the knowledge that John had built up over. Uh, at that point, he was, uh, you know, j just coming up to half a century of doing nothing else. Um, you know, every day, every day he was building and repairing casts, and the amount of knowledge that he had stored over that time, you know, we felt we really need to pass it on to the next generation. So, so John agreed. You know, he was, um, he was, he was absolutely on board for this so we established a uh, we didn't have any buildings ready in in Lahardon at all you know we were literally just starting on on a distillery so what we did is we rented a premises up in Kilbegan where John was and um you know moved in to an empty building with a couple of tools and um you know much like the distillery we started from there um and you know bit by bit started to build up um what was there so this 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 picture you're looking at is darren leonard then um from lahardon and uh darren had uh, studied um craft in in college and um uh was was through through that you know so we knew was a great candidate for an apprenticeship um so and darren was interested in in starting this apprenticeship so so we decided to, uh, you know, formalize this. We signed his indenture papers, and he started on his four-year apprenticeship with John to to become a, a, a cooper. Um, so poor, poor Darren, he lived in Lahardon. If anyone knows the geography of this, he lived in Lahardon, and we sent him down to Kilbegan every day, uh, which is about a two-hour drive there in the morning and about a two-hour drive back and a hard day of work in between. Uh, there's there's two things I want to talk to you about in a second. One is the indentured uh, papers, uh, which are, are fascinating, and then the second, which actually is this, is is the whiskey. Why don't we talk about this whiskey while we um, while we continue the chatting about the cooperage? So you you've sent kindly sent this bottle over for for me to try. Um, what is this whiskey, and what relevance has it to what you've been doing at the cooperage and to John specifically? Well. Uh as we grew the cooperage, you know, we grew out the business and we've, um, we've, uh, you know, continued to build the distillery, which we'll, we'll get to, um, um, later. So, uh, one of the things we decided to do uh, along the journey with John is, uh, he was 50 years in the trade and we said, John, we need to get a whiskey that's about your 50 years in the trade this kind of a celebration of of the you know the craft and so uh, we decided on this uh, product uh, not the one you're drinking actually and so uh, this here was a, a ten year old uh, single malt Scotch whiskey um, uh, that we got our hands on and we said very um, we really intend to bring in some limousine oak from France um, into the cooperage. Uh, chop it all up. So the limousine oak was previously used in cognac casks, which are uh, typically around the 450 liter uh, size. So they're quite big, you know, they're they're the size of me. Um, and so we wanted the wood that's in them, but we wanted to make octave casks. So an octave cask is a name of a cask, hence the octave, you know. Um, but it, it's measured off the European standard of 500. So it's an eighth of 500 litres, if you're with me, which comes out to around 62 litres. So small little casks and, and uh, you know, the size of the cask has a very, very um, um, powerful effect on the maturation that you're going to get. Um, so we wanted to use these small casts. We said we'd send them over to Scotland. You guys fill them. Um, we'll finish them in limousine oak octaves, and then we'll bottle it as um, the Cooper with John's uh, life and story. And so that's why it was a Scotch, is because it was John. Um, you know, and so the idea was John would, you know, front this this product, talk about it. Um, he was he was a real character, and you know. Uh, you know, he'd work away all day and hard days work. Um, but, you know, 
if there was any sort of publicity or anything going on in the evening, Jan would be the first there, no, no problem at all. So and really liked the idea of, of this product as well, you know. Um, so it's something we did. Uh, we produced it. We sent the cast to Scotland, John and the two apprentices. Um, at this stage now, catching up with the story, Darren's brother, Ian, had also started his apprenticeship. Um, so we had the two guys working with John. Um, and <clears throat> so they made every single one of the octave casks, um, you know, laboriously um slowly and we sent them all to be filled um in scotland um so there's the two guys yeah ian's ian's on the right there and darren's on the left um and so we had made this product we literally just had it bottled um you know we brought brought a bottle of the finished uh thing down to john in the cooperage you know and so that was really the plan we had at that stage and so John very suddenly then um, passed away, uh, really unexpectedly, caught all of us really by surprise um, and totally changed our plans, you know, changed our plans for Cooper. You know, John was, he was only 66 and, um, you know, we were absolutely no intention of retiring anytime soon. Um, you know, he, he tried a little bit of... Uh, rest and relaxation after he left Kilbegan and it didn't really suit him. So he had no intention of retiring. Uh, so we were making plans for, you know, what we do for the next 10 years, really. Um, and uh, so that all changed, you know, very, very, very quickly. And so the product kind of changed. Um, one of the things you'll notice about the product, if, if you get your hands on one of the original, um, is that it's all written, in, you know, very much in the present tense. Um, you know about John and his and his story. So um, we had uh, then in 2018, John had made five uh, special octave casks, and really the purpose of this was experimentation on our part. You know, we had made maybe 150 of the limousine oak. We wonder we'd go with this. You know, with John's story, would we do something else? Um, and so we had made five um, little octaves. Uh, one of them was from uh, fresh American oak that we recharred. One of them was from a Premier Cru Sauterne, a Namaroni cask, a Barbados rum cask, and um, one of them was from a, a French oak port. And so purely we were, um, you know, seeing where we'd, uh, we'd, we'd sample them later. Um, so as just as life would have it, they ended up being the last five casks John ever made. Um, now they had been sent to Scotland um, and you know were, were filled with whiskey just as John passed away. So we had kind of forgotten about them really, not forgotten about them, but hadn't been paying much huge attention until we kind of realized then that they were the last casks that he ever made. Um, and so it took us a while to kind of see, you know, what, what we do with with that, you know, and, you know, would we would we kind of uh, bottle them at some stage, you know, and so it, it seemed a shame not to um, not to do something to kind of uh, celebrate and kind of mark and, uh, you know, commemorate the life of, of John. So so what we did is we um, we sampled each of the five of them and we we thought what if we vatted what if we vatted these you know which is absolutely not the intention starting out because you know it's quite the it's quite the mix um but it is you, very very different isn't it very unusual mix i poured i'm gonna pour myself a dram here but yeah i have a drop here we should raise a glass <laughs> to john shouldn't we absolutely it Let's launch it to John. So when we sampled them um, and and tried vatting uh, the five casks, we were pretty we were pretty taken back by the uh, you know how the combination actually kind of held together. Um, you know what we were attracted by, of course, was you know the poetry of them being five octaves, kind of representing 
representing five decades of, of John's life in the craft. Um, but absolutely amazing um, color, firstly, is the first thing you'd notice. I, I'm not sure if this will come through on screen, but from the original sure product there, yeah. to two years later. Oh, yeah. Big difference, isn't there? That's the same. It's the same 10-year-old malt, and um, there's there's just a different uh just a difference in aging um different different casks obviously the the port will have added you know a certain kind of red hue to it um and then the 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 fresh charred american oak um you know the fresh char adds a real burst of color very very quickly to a to a spirit so um so this is what we ended up with. So we released this then through um, James Fox in Dublin, who you might be familiar with across from Trinity. Um, beautiful store. Um, mm. Now, obviously, we kind of, it ended up being more of an online um, because, uh, of course, uh, pandemic pandemic in between and the store has been closed for, for a lot of that time. But they have a great website, uh, jamesfox.ie. And so that's really where we've been, um, you know, focused on. on, on so this on became a commemorative release then, not intended, it was never intended to be a commemorative release, but unfortunately and sadly it had to be just 360 bottles were ever released uh, of, yeah. the, of the 12 year old. Well, there were like, there's 360 bottles because when we took the five octaves and, uh, and vatted them, it was 360 bottles. Um, so that's that's why there's 360 bottles no more exist and you know it's it's purely a once off um you know it's not something you can repeat anyway because they just happen to be the last five so totally once off and we totally totally bought it. and um you know we're retailing it it retails at quite a high um price you know and we decided to um give half of the profits then to john's to john's wife um uh, just as a, um, just as a, a sort of a commemorative, you know, a piece of the the commemorative. So, um, it's got a kind it's of really, a good aspect to it, and it's it's something that's kind of really. It was really nice for the rest of the company to kind of do something, you know, and get involved in something for John. I don't think there's another whiskey that we've tried that has such a story. And you almost don't want there to be any whiskies that have such stories because it's only come about because of a sad story and a, an unfortunate story. But what a remarkable story it really is. And, and it really is a lovely, beautiful tribute to John and his work. And there's so many aspects that you've highlighted that tie in five octaves, five decades of his life, the last five he ever made, or five decades of his experience in, in Coopering. Um, extraordinary. Uh, it's hard to put into words you know what you've got in your glass is the product of some a very long story and a great story and then ultimately one with a, a an awful ending yeah yeah and <clears throat> that's certainly part of it you know um it's quite a sad kind of ending but at the same time we also wanted to be kind of celebratory um you know because uh, John loved the the first product, you know, was was actually quite proud of it, you know, you could see instantly. Um, and I think a lot of that goes back to, um, you know, certainly in Scotland, I suppose, which was a much more developed kind of industry. Um, the Coopers maybe didn't always get the kind of um, the the level of respect that they that they deserved, you know. Um, and so I, I think that the kind of the Cooper was you know maybe kind of the more forgotten end of you know there was a lot more celebration of of distilling um you know which obviously you know it's kind of it's kind of silly to rank the different aspects you know they're all part of it of a kind of a story but i i honestly think that was the case um you know um probably not so much now i think um or certain certainly here but um, a great a great question that came in, Mark, from Shane. Did did the two lads get to complete their apprenticeship, or how did that work with the sad passing of John? They did indeed. Yeah, John had had uh, just coming towards the end of of their apprenticeships. Then it's a four year apprenticeship, you know, and so uh, one of the one of the guys that John used to work with, um, you know, back in his youth in Scotland, um, came over to us for a little. 
was um, a guy by the name of Jim Whitelaw um, who uh, uh, came over and just kind of finished the you know finished all aspects of um, as a as a Cooper. Then you get a trade test done by the guild. And so they would have come over from Scotland to test the guys, you know, to write them their their papers. Um, but Jim really helped with that transition. Like we were right at the end of it, and you know, it was terrible timing. Um, you know, you couldn't have you couldn't have made up worse timing. So Jim really kind of stepped in, you know, to to just f finish the transition then and get get Darren, Darren and Ian qualified. What does a apprentice Cooper become when they finish their apprentice? Is it Cooper? Is that their Cooper. title? Yeah, Cooper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they start out as apprentice and a four-year apprenticeship to become a Cooper, um, and then they continue as a Cooper. Um, the the term Master Cooper, um, then, you know, this is with the according to the to the guild, there's a federation of of Coopers. Um, so this might vary, you know, by by region, of course, but um, but their their um, terminology then the, a master Cooper is not somebody who's just uh, spent an awful lot of years as a Cooper. It's actually a term for uh, people who are training the apprentice Coopers. So um, you could be you could be doing this for thirty years. And you might necessarily be a master cooper, which isn't any, which isn't any. It's not a, a disrespect that you're not yet a master. The master cooper was the person responsible for the training of the of the apprentice coopers. Does um, the master does the does a master cooper then have to have a certain level of uh, qualification from the guilds to be able to train an apprentice themselves? Yeah, so they would they would train the apprentice during those years as well, and then their apprentice has to qualify um, as well for them to become the the master cooper. You know, oh, wow. so wow. Uh, I suppose it's a journey that they that the guys will start on at some stage. You know, um, and that's that's where they're that's where they're headed. Um, these are some of the barrels now that they've made. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you. I mean, uh, we we use the terms of of different barrels very interchangeably. Would I be right in saying that all barrels are casks, but not all casks are barrels? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we do kind of like a lot of English uh, words. We kind of use them a bit interchangeably. But um, a barrel, a barrel, um, you know, an American standard barrel uh, would be the second from the left of the photo there holding uh, just under 200 liters um and so that would be a, an american standard barrel or people would call them ab's you know american barrels um so the one to the left of it then would be a cask you know certainly not a barrel um it, the one to the left of it would be a punchin um and would be a common kind of european size for a uh, cognac um would would use a lot of punchins it's not actually a butt um, so in in sherry in sherry um, in the south of Spain they would use butts um, and we do a lot of we do a lot of butts but they're not in the they're not in the picture there they'd be taller than your punchin um, and slightly higher capacity at five hundred liters. So a butt a butt is a unit of measurement a bit like a barrel is a unit of measurement isn't it like a barrel is two hundred liters a butt is five hundred liters so. If, Somebody asks you for a buttload of something. If they don't bring you five hundred liters of it, you should send them back. <laughs> they bring yeah, absolutely, yeah. And they've all got, um, you know, they've all got really um, kind of interesting kind of names. You know, like an octave, you know, which would be the style we made, being one eighth of a of a cask. But of course, it's um, you know very like quarter casks as well that you can see used in in Scotland. Um, a lot of people, when they hear quarter cask, would think of a 50 liter because they divide 200 by four. But quarter cask standard is typically um, a quarter of, of 500. So there'd be 125 liter um, casks. Um, so it's just kind of interesting, really, the way that we kind of use use the terminology. But a butt would also have you know very specific dimensions to a cooper as well. So it's not just any 500 liters, you know, a butt would have a standard, um, would have a standard build, uh, would have a standard head size, you know, a, a, a bilge then. Um, so they were developed as, as styles and would be kind of, um, you know,
you know, if we wanted to build something, we would reference what um, what's in the Cooper's Encyclopedia as the, you know, the makeup of one of those. We wouldn't just uh, start and see if it turns out at 500 litres, you know, there would be yeah. a specific bend. There would be a specific bend for your staves, a uh, specific head size. So you'd know you'd know that you were going to get it right um, once you built it. Yeah. The, if you've just joined us, I'm here with Mark Quick, founder, uh, director and co-founder of Nathan Whiskey Distillery in Cooperage. And uh, if you have any questions at all, there's lots of questions coming in and we're going to get to as many of them as we possibly can this evening. If you have any questions at all, I have 500 questions in my head. Poor Mark doesn't know what he's in for tonight. Uh, please put in the comments there on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's just joining us. Uh, Tim Murphy and the gang in Cove and Cork joining in. Great to have you join us again. Um, there's so many aspects to that. There's a, a historical aspect to this line of work. This goes back generations and generations. You mentioned something that I want to come back to, which is the idea of signing papers, indentured papers. And I remember touring Middleton Distillery and touring Ger Buckley, Master Cooper Ger Buckley, his cooperage down in Middleton and, and him pointing out the, the framed old uh, certificates that would have been signed, papers, contracts that would have been signed where years ago, a young boy of 12 or 13 years of age would have had to have signed his life away and would have had to have agreed to not marry or or see a woman or uh, leave the distillery or take a drink. Um, I'm assuming that that level of indentured servitude no longer exists, but why do you still use that term and, and what does it mean today? Well, we tried that with the two lads, and it didn't. It didn't seem. <laughs> <good>. uh, <laughs> the, the the women and the drink uh, seemed to come in anyway. But actually, uh, f funny enough, um, one uh, one of my favourite stories of John's was from his early uh, years in in Dundas, um, in Cooperage over in in um, just outside of Glasgow, and when he started work in the morning at quarter to eight um they would open the two hatches on the site and they would pour everybody who was working there a dram now a free pour he used to say you know there was no measurements uh, at all you got a glass and it yeah. was poured until there was a good pour in there and so you'd line up at the hatch everybody was working and you'd have your dram of whiskey and the next guy would get the same glass you know it wasn't like everyone was getting a glass for themselves he'd be next in line, he'd get the same glass poured. And so what John used to do as a young guy, of course, you know, as an apprentice Cooper, is he'd <clears throat> be first in line. And the idea, of course, was to get everybody into work on time. And he'd be first in line at quarter to eight when the hatch opened and he'd have his dram and then he'd run to the other side of the site, quite a large place, and uh, he'd run to the other side of the site to the other hatch and he'd be at the back of that line so he'd have two <laughs> drams, he'd have two drams in the morning before he started a bit of work um and so so certainly by even john's time um that idea of 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 no drink okay. during the adventure was certainly long gone um uh, the women the women then it might be a different might be a different story Back then, I suppose they would have been, the distillery might have offered housing or they may have, would they have lived on site perhaps in some distilleries where a group of lads all huddled together probably in one room and 20 yeah. cots in one space. They would have all been working under the the long apprenticeship under the master cooper um, and they wouldn't have left that spot, would they? They wouldn't have left the distillery very often. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that was absolutely the case. A lot of them would have lived on site um, during during those days. And uh, John, after after, you know, a good while after serving out his apprenticeship, uh, became what what the Scots would call a journeyman cooper. So he would have his bag of tools and be on the road and call to um, distilleries uh, then to do the kind of repair of uh, casks which were already full of whiskey, you know, obviously in their bonded, in their bonded storage. So a journeyman would then go around from distillery to distillery, um, you know, like w especially with the geography of of Scotland and you know transport was obviously a little bit harder uh, the longer back you go. So they would stay in the distilleries. Um, they would stay in the distilleries at those times you know they would the distilleries typically would have different sort of lodgings usually or if not it would be kind of a local 
community um who would you know they'd know where to put up the the journeyman cooper who was there could be there for a couple of days or something and then he'd move on to the next distillery and this could be as far north as you know wick in the north of scotland or it could be out you know uh, you take a trip to the islands then and you'd end up on you'd end up in the middle of in the middle of nowhere maybe for a week or two or you know four if the work was going so um you know, you'd be doing all sorts of work then, of course. We we do as well, like we'll go out to a client site here in Ireland and they'll have barrels full of whiskey um, that need that need some attention. So uh, one of the one of the most um, hair raising things to watch is uh, one of the lads changing a stave in a barrel that's a full of whiskey. Because if you get that wrong, there's 200 liters of precious malt inside the barrel. So you tend to, you tend to, you tend to try and avoid doing it if you can at all, but it can, it can be done. You know, if you'd have the yeah. barrel laying on its side and you'd be changing the very top one. So the level of the whiskey would be slightly underneath where you're changing, but you have to keep the rest of the barrel firmly constructed while you're taking out an individual stave and First, replace yeah. it. So it doesn't all fold in on itself. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of the high stakes end of Cooperage. Um, Mark was kind enough to share a video before we went live, uh, and it's a it's a beautiful video, and I've posted it on the Stories and Sips Facebook page, and also I posted it in our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. And if you've got Netflix at home, you might have come across a category on Netflix that's called Slow Television. And you can follow a Norwegian train through the fjords, or you can follow an Eskimo, an Inuit through the Arctic on the back of a sled, or you can watch a fire burning for hours. But they've got nothing on this video because it's a video, beautiful video, raw, unedited sound and footage of, of John making a cask. I think he's making an octave, is he, um, in, in this yeah. video. It's, it's a beautiful video, 18 or 19 minutes. And I'd encourage you, don't leave now because we've got more to talk about. When you, but when, when this is over tonight, go check out that video. Beautifully done. And it shows the handicraft, the, the skill, the clearly the generations of handed down knowledge that go into the manufacture and the repair of barrels and casks using tools that are handed down too for from generation to generation aren't they those are tools that coopers yeah. might inherit from their fathers their uncles their grandfathers and i presume you're still using tools like that today yeah yeah i mean uh, from from our research um what what we found is um that the Romans seem to have been the first to uh, document when they came across the Celts, um, they, they documented that they were using these wooden vessels. Um, so I, I think I think earthenware was, you know, really at the core of, of the Roman kind of transport of liquids. And so um, I, I'm not sure if that's the earliest reference to them or not, but uh, certainly there was a reference then to the Celts using this two and a half thousand years ago. And so the earliest casks then, um, um, you know, which you can see um, were hollowed out of a single piece of, of wood, you know, where they started. But this design then from the Celts of um, uh, heads and stave design. So the heads being the two circles, if you if you want, at the at the two ends, and then the staves being the vertical um, uh, pieces or horizontal, depending on which way you have it lying. But the the longer the longer pieces of of curved wood in between, um, and then the the metal hoops um, driven down on the outside. So that picture there is Ian. Um, uh, with with probably John's hammer actually that I look at it and a driver and so he is the driver just on the metal hoop there and uh, as he as he goes around the barrel he'll move around the barrel while he's doing this that that band or hoop is sized so that the curve of the barrel is going outwards towards the middle and so as you drive those metal bands down you're key, you're you're just putting huge pressure on all of those staves, which are, those staves have a have an angle on each of them so that they sit into each other. And once you drive that pressure down, um, the head itself is sitting into what's called a crow's, which is kind of like a channel um, that's dug into all of the staves around. So the head is sitting nicely 
in there. And as you drive the hoops down, you're creating this huge inward pressure. So each of the staves is just pushed up against the other and then the head is getting squashed on all sides. Um, so I, actually I have one here. Um, so you can see this is the crows at the top. So that's a channel dug into the wood there. Um, and then the, the head will be shaped where it'll narrow at the at the edges of that of that uh, of its circumference and it'll sit nice and tightly into there so the thing that used obviously there's no glue involved there's no screws and um, there's no nails the only other thing that's used then is this uh, river rush so this is really kind of interesting stuff um you know it grows obviously uh, it grows at uh, and the wetlands but once you dry it out um, it's got a very spongy center to it. So uh, we'll split this and uh, use it around primarily. It's used sometimes between staves, but primarily it's been between the head uh, of the barrel and the staves all the way around the head. So they call it flagging and it'll be just sitting between the head and the, the staves. So if any liquids, once, once any liquids are in the barrel, if any liquids make it as far as this barrier, um, it's a very, very spongy middle. So it has the effect of expanding. Um, so a perfect natural liquid insulation for tight spaces. It'll expand yeah. and it'll stop any more liquid coming once it once it gets wet. No, no more liquid will make it out through there. Would so, those rushes now be used fairly st as standard in, in the manufacture and, uh, of, of casks even to this day? Yeah, to this day, yeah, and uh, Ireland and Scotland, um, you know, would would use these um, in in different areas. They uh, in different areas they they use different. The the French will typically use a kind of a clay putty, um, so you'll see it sometimes on on barrels, you know, that we'll get in that are from wines or sweet wines or stuff. There's a kind of a clay putty that they use, um, okay. so this would be more a kind of an Irish Scottish thing you know um and so you, you know obviously you want to stay away from the use of any kind of um you know non-natural sealants or anything like that you know um so uh it's perfect perfect natural kind of solution to that you mentioned the french there and, and we got a question in earlier on that kind of ties in here as well um and that is uh, regarding chestnut and i have a whiskey here that i want to open next which is method and madness single pot still that has been matured in bourbon and sherry but it has been finished in french chestnut and of course in ireland we're not limited by the type of wood we can use the scots the poor scots must stick with their oak but in ireland we can use other types of wood um and i presume in the cooperage then you're working with more types of wood than just oak would that be fair yeah yeah absolutely and the irish whiskey technical file um I don't have a copy to hand, but I, I think it says three years in wooden barrels, typically oak. Um, typically oak. Is, is what but it says. atypically can be something else. You can, the, the, exactly. the, the smart Irish will work their way around the word like typically and use uh, it to their advantage. That's 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 a, a beacon to anybody in Ireland if they see the word typically. Yeah, that's, that's definitely. <laughs> what you there. do when it's not <laughs> So um, I have here, so yeah. this is finished in French chestnut. Um, help us understand the benefits the pros and cons of the, diff, the 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 most popular different types of wood that are now starting to appear in ireland outside of oak yeah um inside of oak to start um you know the range like oak is is certainly not just oak you know the the breadth of of oak is is staggering you know um, so there's all sorts of different types types of oak, um, and so uh, I, I picked up while I was down at the cooperage two of these uh, because I knew I was going to be uh, this evening. So if you can see the um, the the two pieces there, we've got an American oak on top and a European oak on on the bottom. So a Quercus alba and a Quercus robe. And those um, are very distinct. You can you can see the difference probably. I think in in the grain, um, the American oak 
it's very fast growing, uh, very, very straight, uh, perfect, perfect wood for making barrels with. Um, you can see the European uh, grain tends to be like a little bit more knotted, uh, uh, certainly, certainly a wavier sort of grain, which is what you'll always see. The color, the color is distinctly different uh, as well. You'll see the the you know as the name Quercus alba suggests, uh, it's a white oak. So you'll see that that whiteness um, visually as well. So we're going to have hugely different um, influences on on your whiskey depending on the type of oak you start out with. Actually, I'm I'm drinking. I'm about to crack open. Uh, a Mizunaro oak from Glendalough then as well. And so again, a different species of oak um, to, you, to your American oak. Um, so huge, huge amount of variety in oak. Then there's other woods, um, you know, French chestnut here. I actually tasted some of this Method of Mazna. It's beautiful whiskey. Um, uh, the, the chestnut um, is probably... Um, you know, it's 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 uh, used a good bit in in France um, and is used in in wine um, to an extent. It's probably the second uh, most common now. I stand to be corrected on that um, in use in European barrels after oak. <clears throat> but um, yeah, we'd see a good bit of chestnut um, uh, floating around. Um, the other types of wood, then uh, you know, maple wood has been used um, mm. as well. Yeah. Um, is there an Irish whiskey in the market that has spent time in maple? Uh, there, not yet. Not yet. See, I was trying to draw it out here because I knew there wasn't. I thought you might say, yeah. "Oh, there's one coming from." <laughs> no, client confidentiality now, of course. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, uh, types of cedar um, that can be used um, for sure. And will be used, and then you know, as he gets uh, speciality, we've done some really um, unusual style of barrels. Um, one uh, I don't mind saying because it's been used previously. Actually, there was a Connemara um, from John Teeling's Distillery, um, which was aged in uh, bog oak, and so uh, bog oak is obviously. Um, oak that's thousands of years old and um got got uh, just preserved in the peatlands or boglands of the country and so even it can be used in kind of barrel manufacturing now this would be on the very niche end of things um it's extremely difficult to work with obviously um is is one of the drawbacks and actually a lot of um a lot of the this comes down to flavor. Oak has like a uh, hugely flavorsome uh, compounds, you know. So the lactones and the tannins in oak lend itself perfectly to interacting with with the spirit. So once well, let's, can we talk about that for a second, uh, Mark? That, that, yeah. That's a really interesting point. And when I first learned about the contribution of wood, that was a surprising thing to me. Um, I naively thought that when you charred a barrel or when you set fire to the barrel on the inside and that's what gave it the flavor but of course it's there's compounds in the wood that are contributing to to the um to the whiskey and all every species of oak and every species different species of wood will have different compounds and different flavor contributors and will they and, and they will interact in different ways chemically with the spirit that goes into that cask absolutely and like you're starting to pick apart the 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 layers you know of you know what type of oak is it you know, we haven't gotten into how it's dried, you know, because they're dried in different ways for different lengths of time. Um, then, you know, mm -hmm. what are they used for before we use them in whiskey? Now, uh, another thing that's kind of becoming a little bit more common is the use of virgin oak, you know, which hasn't had anything before Irish whiskey in it. Um, but traditionally, um, that wouldn't be a huge part of, of Irish whiskey. Typically, they'd have been used um, in something else, a port, a sherry, you know, what type of sherry then, you know, we go we go down a huge kind of avenue then of all sorts of different types. It's a rabbit hole, isn't it? Yeah. What age, yeah. What age are they then? You know, have they been used twice for, for um, you know, have they been used twice in whatever it is that has had them before? 
um, you know, how long, because of course, port isn't just port either, you know, you know, are we talking a Ruby port, a Tawny port, you know, they can be different ages within that. And so then, um, you know, you're into then cask size as well. What size is your cask going to have a different influence on the whiskey? So there's uh, the other thing you mentioned then, is it toasted, is it charred? Um, they also will have very different effects on, on the end product as well. So um, there's just so many contributing factors to uh, what you're picking. As, and so it's still within oak at this stage, and then you introduce something yeah. like chestnut and you open up, you open up a, a, whole, a whole other set of, of kind of flavor introductions. Um, I, I would say though, chestnut is any any chestnut age whiskey um, I've I've tasted has been you know really nice. That method and madness, you know, as a perfect example. Um, but it's very there's a very distinct note uh, profile with the chestnut uh, finish that I found, and it's like uh, it, it takes. It took me a few sips to get into it, and then once I got into it, I realized. I almost can't live without it. It's just such yeah. a beautiful spice and fruit that I hadn't experienced from any other whiskey previously. Yeah, yeah, so so distinctive, you know, certainly. And I think that, you know, the less used to it you are, the 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 more the more you kind of notice it st straight away, you know. But uh, that that matter the madness, the lovely lovely whiskey. Um, and I would say that you know the, one of the one of the major reasons um for you don't see more of certain types of wood is that you know certain types of oak and and chestnut they're much more porous than than oak so as soon as you use one of those barrels your losses are going to be a lot higher um than a than a an american oak barrel that 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 we could give you you know so right certainly that's why you don't see them as common for certainly, you know, if you're finishing, it's one thing, but if you have a whiskey aging for, you know, 15, 20 years, um, you're going to get natural losses anyway, because uh, the, the, the whiskey is being soaked into the wood and then it's sweating back out of the wood as the temperature fluctuates, you know, over the seasons, over the course of the day, you've got this constant motion of being drawn into the wood and, and coming out of the wood. And so it's dissolving, you know, the, the alcohol is dissolving um, a lot of the compounds in the whiskey. So it's taking its color, um, it's taking different flavors from that. And so those, uh, those reactions are happening over the course of years, you know. Um, now in the warmer climates, we'll say like Kentucky, um, you know, that maturation happens uh, faster, which is why you'll see bourbon typically being much younger than um, we'll say an Irish or Scottish uh, whiskey. So <clears throat> you get different effects depending on, um, you know, that's another thing. So with so many variants of the barrel, but then where you store the barrel afterwards creates a whole other set of variants that play into this as well. Um, you, so, you mentioned, I mean, the likes of French chestnut um, and casks that have previously contained port and the different types of port, all of these are casks that had something in them previously and they've come to Ireland, they've then been reutilized and uh, have continued their life, many of them for sometimes decades longer. Um, what does that mean for you as a service cooperage then? What are you doing with other distilleries and with other whiskey brands? You're not making barrels from scratch then presumably um, or are you, or is most of the work repairing? Help us understand that service side of the business. Yeah, yeah, we do make casks from scratch. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, but I suppose when when you look at the volume of casks out there, uh, the, the very much the volume uh, driver of Irish whiskey is the American standard barrel that has aged bourbon. Um, so they will be. Uh, coming from Kentucky, used in Irish whiskey, um, and then can be reused then as well. So um, we say when, when we fill them with Irish whiskey first, um, you know, it's, it's totally down to this distillery's choice. Will they use them again as a second fill Irish whiskey barrel? Um, you know, sometimes they'll have a, you know, purely, 
purely custom to the distillery. They'll move them from their malt to aging their grain, um, you know, and use them there. Um, and then <clears throat> they would maybe uh, send them back to us for repair um, at that point, because at some point during the life of the barrel, uh, it's going to need attention, you know. So uh, from from a point of view of, of kind of ensuring that your next fill is going to be okay and you're not going to get a load of losses, you can send it to the cooperage to get either checked or else they're doing the checks themselves and just sending us the ones that need attention, you know. Okay. So okay. Either okay. way, we do still do it differently. Like we'll check every barrel and repair the ones that need to be repaired. Um, so that that ends up being a quite a quite a big volume of work really across Irish whiskey when you think of the number of number of barrels in circulation and then all sorts of different years uh, down through the ages. So um, so we'll be doing that. We also then um, will be kind of rebuilding barrels for people. So um, some uh, when they've been used once or twice or three times, we'll, we'll strip a layer from the oak and we'll give it a fresh, fresh char um, okay. For, okay. for its next use. So some distilleries use that, uh, some don't, you know, um, some of those gets exported. And so it's just a huge mix of kind of requirements. So as a service cooperage, really, we kind of are there to serve the requirements of the other distilleries, not to kind of um, put our own vision of um, of what they should be doing to them yeah, yeah. the other way around of what do they need done. So uh, some other stuff would be reductions. You know, we'd, we'd often get in butts, which you now know is 500 litres, and they'd want those butts then reduced to, could be octaves, you know, on the smallest end or um, could be, um, could be um, uh, hogsheads, which are half the size of a butt or whatever it is. So they've got their own reason for doing it sometimes. Uh, sometimes they want to change ends. Uh, sometimes it's functional that they're just leaking. Uh, sometimes it's stylistic that they want to do something with the whiskey um, and you introduce something else. So really we're there to kind of um, to service the requirements of, of what other people are doing. You know, what we do ourselves then is a whole different whole different kettle of fish, you know. So, the, you, you mentioned, well, actually, there's one question here from Tim. Uh, how about ash? Has ash ever been used uh, or is that just for Hurley's? Would you use that for, for <laughs> maturing whiskey at all? Uh, I've never seen it used, um, honestly. Um, uh, I would say I would say one of the the drawbacks of uh, one of the other things that lends itself to oak being predominant um, is that it's a really nice wood to work with. So we'll say when we want to get that curve on on the barrel, um, we've a steam steam that we use. So once you steam, uh, the staves are nice and and pliable, and so we can we can produce those nice uh, curves uh, for ourselves uh, without. The wood being so brittle that if you do that with some some hardwoods, you'll you'll just literally snap them, you know. So uh, um, <clears throat> I'm I'm not sure if ash falls into that category now. Um, I'd I'd ask the Coopers that one, but a lot of woods that would be quite pleasant flavor wise for some other technical kind of or or kind of just. Um, workable reason don't get used because they're difficult to work with you know you, you mentioned mark that the majority by volume of, of casks that are used in ireland today are ex bourbon corcus alba american oak barrels and they've been coming over fairly consistently and increasingly so since the 1960s prior prior to the 1960s and going further back what would whiskey have been matured in and where would that? Uh, where would those casks have come from? Uh, well, certainly, there's a lot of records of trade between Ireland and France and Spain. Um, you know, so many records. So there's some really interesting ship dockets that that you can uh, look at, which will you know list what's on the ship. Uh, now, most of the time, they don't give the kind of you know because they weren't as uh, into it as we might be now you know they were doing it for very different reasons of of what the log was but you can see um you know whiskey shipments coming and going in 
from the from a, a destination you can kind of assume that the trade was wine coming into the country and then uh, whiskey leaving the country presumably because you know i'm i'm not sure i'd, I'd leave it to a historian now to give you the very accurate version of of this but uh, I think that the Celts primarily used um, this for transport, you know. Um, casks are designed to be really nice uh, vessels to move around. Um, so you've got something that weighs a huge amount of weight, but it's actually quite in a barrel in a different direction. It's very easy to roll one, um, you know, onto a ship, off a ship, uh, swing it around to the other direction. So now also the, the design gives it a lot of strength, you know, that you wouldn't get as a cylinder, um, you know, and also if it was cylindrical, you wouldn't be able to drive the hoops down to get tight. So you need you need the curvature to make sure that the hoops get tight as well. So um, it's kind of hard respectively. For the maturation of whiskey. Um, you know, store fruits, uh, store fish in in the barrels for transport. So, um, you know, it's a pretty pretty probably accurate guess to suggest that it was kind of transportation related. Um, and you'll often hear kind of anecdotally that that's how, how color in whiskey was discovered. That you know it left um, in a barrel, and by the time it got somewhere else, they had discovered that it was gone from a clear liquid to a to a colored liquid. So uh, very hard to know what the accuracy of any of this sort of stuff is, but uh, it's yeah. very easy to certainly imagine that that happened exactly like that at some point. I'd imagine um, then that the, the charring or the toasting aspect um, of the of the, the the cask manufacturer was not something that was, was planned scientifically. Was that something that was, was that by pure accident that that came about and then it was discovered that there were certain properties as tends to be the case with the greatest inventions of all time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, another another area where you hear all sorts of stories, you know, from legends of uh, dragons uh, charring the casks, you know, to, to sort of more, <clears throat> more plausible kind of explanations. But um, I, I certainly don't know um, what the accuracy of that is, but you could imagine that it probably um, wasn't developed as a flavor um, experiment the first time. Um, I, I would say that it possibly happened by accident at some point and then was, you know, a pleasant kind of sensory discovery. But uh, very hard to know where that is. But the, the effect of charring or uh, toasting the barrels is very significant in the flavor of whiskey, you know. Um, so it really, I have one here that's, um, you know, would have a, a, a light toast on the inside versus <clears throat> the second one that have a char. So when when customers are asking us to char, they would uh, tend to pick a level of char um, that they want, and then we'll char all of their barrels to that. Uh, some, some companies use a numbering system, so they'll say like a number one char, number two char, and they're getting heavier as the number goes up. So uh, if you can see in the light, this one has a quite a heavier char, and uh, you'll notice that the char is quite heavy because um, the, the wood starts to crack um, so you'll get a lot of flakes in here. So uh, if you're drinking a, a whiskey that hasn't been filtered just through a, a, a micron filter, you'll see the flakes of the barrel in the whiskey. Um, so nothing nothing wrong with them, obviously. Um, That'd be what's known as an alligator char then, that, that depth of charring. Yeah. yeah, this one's an alligator char here. Now, once you start to see that alligator skin effect, you're into alligator char. So you can see the depth of, of that char there. Um, this would be a good stave, you know, like we're always looking for a good depth of wood here um, because, you know, if you're using stave, you'll start to get cracks uh, all around the center of the barrel where the pressure is greatest. Um, mm. You'll start to see cracks and especially in the bung stave. So the stave that's drilled 
uh, to put a bung in afterwards. You know, that's the that's the weakest of all the staves, obviously, because it's got a huge hole in the middle of it. Um, so you'll send you'll tend to see if you don't have a good a good heaviness of a of a stave, you you know, like developing in a barrel. So obviously, once you start to see that. Uh, somebody who's filling it with all their precious malt, um, you know, would would send it to a cooperage um, then to make sure that it doesn't at some because at some stage if you leave those, they will crack fully, you know, and all your single malts on the floor or whatever you have in it. So you're looking for the opposite of a, of the the thread of a tire, the thread of a tire, where you want the, the deep tread on a tire. You you don't want the same thing necessarily with a cask. You want it to be a little bit lighter or, or, now, or less depth shallower do you uh, on, on the surface and more more wheel <laughs> yeah 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 and you can get it you know you can get away with a little bit of, of of cracking in wood but um i suppose that's where the coopers come into it will tell you which ones are serious and which ones are fine you know are, are you know an, an aesthetic one is no problem at all you know because mostly nobody sees any of these barrels you know uh, but some of them can be extremely serious, you know, and um, you're risking, you're putting all of your risk at, uh, all of your malt at risk, you know. So, uh, but this, this alligator char will have a huge effect, you know. So this this will instantly give you more color um, than, a, than a toasted barrel. So in a very, very short time, you'll start to see a depth of color appearing with this, you know. Um, the other thing it does is it opens up the, the so you'll get uh, more more in drink. Um, so the wood the wood will allow the liquid to seep in that much faster. Now with any wood, you know it's porous uh, to an extent. So some of the woods will be a lot more porous than oak, um, especially when the oak is is quarter sawn. So when the tree when the tree is is a, a log, uh, you for for casks uh you want to you want to quarter sawed rather than plain sawn would be your normal lumber where you just you maximize the volume of wood you're getting out of it but you don't want the grain uh, open so that all of your spirit comes in comes into the wood you know you want it you want the grain going the other way that it's holding the liquid inwards um but it'll still seep in uh, to the wood to an extent, but the more you char it, uh, you're breaking up the the structure, and um, so it'll seep in, it'll seep in faster, you know. Um, it, right, it, right. Another effect it'll have is a natural uh, filtration effect because you're essentially creating, um, you know, you're you're doing a couple of things. You're creating a natural caramelization to the oak sugars that are there naturally, and you're also creating a kind of a charcoal filter really on the inside of mm. your barrel yeah so it's doing so many different things it'll react with the sulfates um that are present in the spirit as well you know so it'll have that filtration effect how many people when they open a bottle of whiskey realize what has gone in at, on the wood side of things to get it to where it is to give that flavor and uh, that color in most cases that has been contributed it is uh, astonishing the there's been a move over the past few years now towards these different types of woods and a lot of experimentation, which I'm sure is to your benefit and, and, and more calls for your help with things. But Irish oak is a question we get a lot of, uh, we get asked about a lot. And I have a bottle here, uh, Middleton Very Rare, Dar Gaelic, Dar Gaelic, mm -hmm. the Irish words for Irish oak. Um, and mm -hmm. this is from Knockrath Forest. The It's called Knockrath Forest uh, release. And that is, the, the, the casks were made from trees that were felled, Irish oak trees that were felled in Knockrath Forest in County Wicklow. And Irish oak has not historically been used in great quantities for maturing whiskey. Can you help us understand why, Mark, and uh, and what kind of role it can play? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of, of, of Irish oak. Um, you know, Middleton, I suppose, brought it to the fore. Um, and uh, there's a lovely little distillery down in County Clare uh, called the Burren Distillery. I don't know if you've uh, come, come across them. Um, and are doing really interesting stuff with with Irish oak, um, and really the reason for its prominence, um, I suppose, was the lack of demand historically. Um, you know, I mean, we didn't have this kind of level of interest in our national spirit, 
you know, I think that's fair to say, you know, going back to kind of before the renaissance of this kind of modern Irish whiskey, we certainly did the further back you go, you know, um, you know, we found some some documents showing uh, 2000 licensed distilleries in the country. Um, and so they were the licensed ones. And uh, there was yeah. there was a lot of um, really, really good quality, though, you know, I mean, um, over over the years, because you know the separation of all of it was whiskey at at one stage or Ishkabaha, and then you know Pochines separated out as a separate category because the pots had to be small, you know. So Pochine, a small pot, went one direction, but that was purely for you know the purposes of evading the law. Um, that if you needed to run, which are still, you couldn't have a 5,000 liter still sitting there. And so that separation kind of became ingrained, really. And uh, I suppose, you know, uh, whiskey distilleries, then the licensed ones went down to, uh, you know, a handful. Uh, so I suppose there just wasn't the demand for, um, for Irish oak to be used for barrels because uh, it, was so, it was so available um elsewhere that the economics wouldn't have stacked up of you know having a small operation you know using those kind of irish oaks so you know that is that is absolutely a huge um part to play in that you know demand and economics drive so many historical decisions you know um as we come to do kind of speciality stuff now driven by Middleton, you know, who are in a, obviously a great space to be able to innovate and be able to bring these things uh, through to market um, because it does require a lot of kind of investment and a lot of time um, uh, to, to bring that through. So when you're starting out, beautiful color, isn't it? That gorgeous, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, when you go out to pick these Irish oak trees, you know, you're maybe in a forest which hasn't been um, tended, you know, its intention wasn't to produce cask quality oak. So you're probably picking out like one out of every 20 trees that you look at that might be suitable. So you're looking for trees that aren't going to have huge quantities of knots um, because knots are something that the coopers don't want to see you know along their staves so you'll see you'll see very 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 not free uh wood you know and american oak especially in the forests that are you know perfectly set up for this and selectively selectively managed uh you know over decades uh you know perfectly suited to this um whereas if you go out to just a, an irish forest that has oak uh, you know, you have a huge amount of tree selection to do first before you go about felling it. Um, so then after that, you know, uh, historically, we have a huge amount of of, of drying um, of, of oak going on here, you know. Um, so, but all that requires is kind of expertise. And much like the barley that we're growing in Mayo, the more you do of it, you know, the more those skills and those learnings become ingrained over time. Um, and so the more you kind of bring bring everybody up to speed. Is it true that um, Irish oak then would be a lot more moisture riddled than uh, an American oak tree that's probably grown in climates like Kentucky, Tennessee, hot summers, moisture is dried out, makes for a tighter grain. Would that, that benefits long-term maturation yeah. as opposed to an Irish oak? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the American oak grows a lot, a lot faster. So we'd we'll mm. say your your growth rings on the on the on the summer wood, you know, will be a will be a lot tighter. So you're already getting a tighter tighter grain naturally, you know. So you've that to deal with in Irish oak as well. So um, you've got that to deal with, and then as well as that, it depends how you dry it. You know, I mean, you can manage the moisture content. You know, when it's felled, you can manage it to wherever you want it to be. Um, you know, it's just a question of, you know, I mean, you can you can always kill and dry wood, but um, it it depends for the flavors that you want in in whiskey. You don't necessarily want to do it the most efficient way, which is exactly the same as maturation, really. Like 
the efficient, fast way to do things is not necessarily the tastiest um, way to do it. So you're always kind of trying to balance these different aspects of, you know, you need to you need to make something at the end of it that's not, you know, every bottle can't be four thousand euros, or, or or you're just the economics don't work. So you're always trying to balance these um, kind of decisions to make sure that what you're getting is is you know the taste that you're that you're looking for but in terms of drying wood you can dry irish oak to to wherever you want it um you know it just it takes longer if you're air drying it here absolutely it takes longer to air dry something here you know than it does in kentucky that's for sure I want to talk about the distillery that you're building. Um, a big part of the, I mean, the, the reason that you have a cooperage is because you're building a distillery. And uh, um, I've got some pictures here I want to put up on the screen. I want to talk about this Middleton Very Rare Dark Gaelic as well in a second because I just had a sip and I'm reminded just how extraordinary it is. It's like sweets. It's like it's like the good notes of furniture polish. It's like mahogany meeting uh, dry, hard, boiled sweets. We'd be familiar with those in Ireland. Uh, extraordinary notes and a very high alcohol by volume as well, 56.6, .6, just a few percentage points short of a, a hand sanitizer. But that'll um, th this would put hairs on your on, on your on your palms. It would, but extraordinary flavour. I don't know. Have you ever tried um, the Dargaluk Knockrat Forest Mark? I have indeed. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while ago. I'd love to have one here to open actually, but I don't. Uh, Should send you one. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you can, you can put up my address there and bottoms are all. <laughs> Text me but, the address uh, there. We'll get started. Beautiful whiskey and, um, you know, such a great innovation from, from Irish distillers, you know, who obviously have great capacity to innovate in the category, um, you know, cause have, have huge capacity to do this and really over the last, um, decade have brought out some kind of stunning, um whiskies you know everything from this this dark gala to the method of madness that you were drinking to um you know all the different innovations it's it's great actually for the whole category um because this introduces people you know and then other distilleries can um incorporate it with some of the kind of um knowledge impartation or the kind of work of kind of uh bringing introducing something to people is always kind of a harder job and um, so it's great to have kind of uh, middleton introducing this sort of stuff and i think you're going to see a lot more irish oak as a result used by other distilleries you know is there uh, collaboration on the on the in the wood world in ireland when you, you talk about middleton which i think we'd all agree would be regarded as having one of the greatest wood programs in the country and I have had for many years would there be a lot of collaboration or, or skill sharing then with the newer distilleries and, and cooperages that are popping up yeah it's like to an extent to an extent I suppose yeah yeah I mean I guess we're quite uh, quite a young stage really in the um in the in the whole industry development you know so there's kind of um there's all sorts of kind of everything going on um all, all over the place and i i think it starts to gel the longer um that that the the operations are in the industry you know so um you know we'd, we'd see that a lot you know over over the last kind of um five or six years in the industry you know we start doing some work you know as a speciality item with the distillery and then we start doing more and more of their of their wood um kind of contributions um and then we're helping them with their supply, their planning um, for future years, you know, and then a good amount of kind of inter interdistillery um, sharing. Um, certainly I've seen it a lot with the kind of newer Irish distilleries doing a lot of um, kind of inter sharing, um, you know, and even, and even like um, we'll say we've done a good amount of we kind of tend to be in the center i suppose of this is that we're dealing with the breweries um so we're you know we're we're using casks in a brewery but then we know that somebody's going to want those after the breweries are you know so we we'll say like stout is obviously the kind of um you know huge driver of that individual segment and a beautiful flavor for for use um so we're kind of 
uh, sit where we're supplying the breweries, but you know, we've always got an eye to where they're going um, later. We've done some really nice stuff with cider as well, um, you know, from Irish, from Irish yep. apple orchard. And uh, you know they'll have a they'll have a next life in in whiskey, you know, and potentially back the back the same way they came then afterwards, you know, for a, an Irish whiskey finished apple cider. So it's it's it, there's so many, you know, the life of a barrel is so interesting, you know, because some of these barrels are you know are fifty years old by the time they're kind of end of life. Some of them are shorter, obviously, and um, depending on, on on their uses, you know. Isn't it extraordinary all of the these elements we're talking about between cider, apples, oak, the whiskey, barley? We're talking about agriculture. We're talking about organic materials. We're talking about the most uh, renewable uh, materials, really. And you talk about a fifty-year lifespan of a, of a, a barrel, and, and maybe that's what it takes to get a tree to be at the height where it's ready to be cut down again and turned into the next round of barrels. A wonderful renewable resource in the production of whiskey, which means that if you want to do your bit for the planet, we should just keep drinking whiskey. It sounds like, and uh, that allows us to keep planting and regrowing. <laughs> Absolutely, and like that's what's that's what's lovely about you know certainly that Irish oak you know is it it predates. Ireland as a as a as a formal country, you know, in our current republic, it it absolutely predates the republic, um, when those trees were planted, and so, you know, it's really it's really nice to think about, you know, the people who were planting those obviously would have no idea that you know here we are in 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 twenty in the in twenty twenty one thinking about felling them for for use in in casks to make. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it's amazing. To appear in a live stream on a Friday night across America, like yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Is so, there much uh, oak growing mark in Ireland at the moment um, that would be earmarked or or that that might be set aside or hopefully set aside for 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 coopering use? Um, I mean, how much is kind of relative? You know, um, like. Plenty, plenty to make speciality finished barrels, you know, um, but it it depends on your kind of uh, per perspective. Like certainly, you, you couldn't make every barrel in in Irish whiskey from Irish oak. Um, we'd have yeah. it all used. We'd have it all used in the year. Um, <laughs> so it kind of depends the quantity. There's plenty. There's plenty to be used um, in in speciality kind of cases, you know, um, you know, splitting it, drying it, uh, felling it, identifying it, um, you know, coopering with it. Then, all sorts of of stuff. We're not set up in Ireland for any sort of scale of that type of manufacture the way they are in France and the U.S. So the scale will never get to that level like these these are huge huge operations in, in france and the us and like we there's no way we'll ever get to that that scale for sure so it'll kind of remain a kind of a really nice a really nice kind of um element you know i guess and it's it's absolutely never going to kind of make its way into mainstream kind of production of our whiskey barrels you know it's um it's not that's not uh, on the cards, you know. I don't think, but I, I think you'll absolutely see really interesting stuff done at, uh, you know, the Baron, for example, who are, you know, doing big, big um, focus on 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 Irish oak, but at a at a scale that's relative, you know, to, <clears throat> um, you, you know, possibly half a day's production at at Middleton or less, you know, in a, in a year. And if you if you if you want to see Irish oak in action, go over to London to the Houses of Parliament, and you can walk on the floorboards that are made of Irish oak, and and plenty of the the the, the Houses of Parliament are, are furnished well with with Irish oak, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, and like you know, historically I, I, Ireland used to have a huge covering of forestry in general, and uh, you know, oak as a huge species within that, and so you know, our our percentage coverage has obviously. Um, you can see one of those graphs that <laughs> if it doesn't depress, if it doesn't depress, 
right, well, if it's gone in the meantime, but um, it's certainly on on the increase again, you know. Um, and so, I mean, who knows? Who knows where we'll go with kind of plantations for for the next kind of century? But uh, that's kind of the perspective you certainly need. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a very long term perspective. Is, yeah. Anything it's yes. not going to happen anytime quickly. Let us move on to uh, the distillery component then of Nathan, because this is interest. This is very interesting. And we mentioned at the start what seems like eight hours ago. Now we've been talking for so long. You've been so kind to share your your knowledge and your insights with us. But you talked about the goal of distilling triple distilled, peated single malt. This is the distillery in construction right here. Is this recently, uh, Mark? Was this long ago? Uh, that was uh, just just prior to, co to lockdown, COVID pandemic type era. Yeah, that's the start of, of 2020. We were putting in the, the final pieces of the building. Um, uh, you can see the glass. This is the glass going into the front, which um, as you look at the building, um, the, the left-hand side is in um, Mayo Stone. And the, the right hand side then is, is glass. So you can see the nice copper pot stills sitting behind the glass. Um, so this was our kind of concept for the distillery. You can see Nathan Mountain in the background. Um, uh, if you went a bit further away, you can see Nathan dominating the skyline. Um, we're, we're up kind of close to the distillery. So, um, yeah, this is this is our, our our concept for the um, architecture of the distillery. We we were uh, we used this stone that we found all across Mayo, and in our lands growing up on the farm I grew up in, there would have been these kind of um, just bumps, um, you know, and we wouldn't have thought a lot of them, but actually what what they were. Um, was a village, a small little kind of um, village at some stage. Some of these had like maybe a group of four, a cluster of four or six houses. And they were abandoned um, during the famine, during the famine years. And so a lot of these, like they're, they're actually quite common. Um, they would just have fallen down, um, you know, and then over the years get covered with layers of soil, you know, grass grows over them and they look like nothing. But um, so we dug one of these up anyway, and uh, we we dug one of these famine villages and we did nothing to the stone except power wash it. And it's amazing because this has been built with several times over the centuries, you know, typically, uh, you know, when they were abandoned uh, famine times, it wouldn't have been the first construction that that stone was used in. You know, these would get built and rebuilt because, you know, there wasn't huge use of mortar and, um, you know, they had to get rebuilt several times over over centuries. So um, so who knows what what age that stone is when it was first cut. But one of the things that you notice about it is it's distinctly cut. You know, it's not natural shape so much. It's man, it's, it's man impacted from tools. So you get this lovely, we just power washed it and you get this beautiful kind of cut stone. And so our concept was to kind of reflect um, that tradition of, of hundreds of years of, um, you know, stone and building in the area and the whiskey tradition that would have gone with that because these people, I can guarantee, were making, uh, you know, a version of Ishkabah in, yeah. in the images as well and then the glass component the glass component was obviously functional we wanted to kind of show off the nice copper pot stills but as well as that the idea of the architecture was to um you know show the old with the with the new because what we did at, at nathan is that it's um it's actually quite a modern sort of plant as well so, you know, obviously the kind of growing of the barley, you know, the cutting of, of turf, the, the malting aspects, the making of barrels, this sort of stuff is like centuries or millennia old. And we're kind of um, using those traditions, you know, for, for what we're doing now. But at the same time, we didn't want it to seem like, 
you know, we were trying to be from the 1600s, you know, it is actually quite modern in a lot of aspects too. Um, you know, so we'd have um, elements of, of SCADA controlled systems within the distillery that are monitoring temperature on sensors. And, you know, so we kind of didn't want to kind of shy away from that either, because that's as much part of the story, the modern aspects as the kind of ancient aspects. And so the design was meant to um, kind of bring that out, that you've this glass, you know, modern kind of glass. And there's, you can see there's a little bit of zinc um, to, to go around the glass and it's sitting side by side with this kind of ancient aspects of, of the stone you know um, and so the, the copper pot stills are wrapped in cardboard by the way in that photo um, so that cardboard will come off <laughs> soon. Would I, be, would I be right in saying that this is the tallest uh, standalone uh, glass wall uh, for distillery in Ireland or would I be yeah. off? I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that's correct <laughs> Um, Jim wants to know what's the uh, what's the rocket ship on the right for? He's probably referring to what looks like a vatting tank or vessel there on the right hand side. Is it uh, lying yeah. down? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's the pot ale tank. Um, so the the end of the end of the distillation process will go into that. That tank is going to be standing up um, external to the distillery on the right hand side as you look at that picture. Um, so obviously that has to get craned upwards and uh, there's a there's a slab to the right. So that takes uh, the last of the, you know, what would be a byproduct. Um, but it's it's really interesting. The byproducts go to animal feed then. So back to your global sustainability of, of drinking whiskey, um, that those byproducts then uh, get stored in a big stainless steel tank there, as you can see, and then get removed for... Um, for feed to animals, you know, the spent grain uh, goes to beef cattle. The uh, the pot ale goes to uh, pig, uh, pig um, eating, or pig feeding primarily. Um, so that's all, that's all where that's all that's left is using the manure to fire up the stills, and and you'll have your you'd have it all you'd have it all closed up altogether. <laughs> well, I mean, that's certainly uh, that's certainly an area that's um, you know. <laughs> That's certainly an area that's under research, um, you know, the use of, of, of kind of bio sources of energy. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it's something like, um, you know, it was, it was really nice to, it's, it's really nice to kind of know that uh, this process isn't creating all of this, this waste, that it has another use uh, down the food chain. Um, <clears throat> you know it's it's um it's it's something that's kind of a nice ending to to the process mark talk about the timeline then for um for the distillery you've got the stills in place maybe the cardboard will be coming off soon but what's your yeah. own timeline for when you'd hope to have your first distillate running um the distillery in operation uh when you how long you might consider maturing your your whiskey for help us understand that next part of the process yeah. Yeah, um, if you asked me this time last year, uh, I'd have guaranteed you that it was going to be distilling in 2020. But uh, as with sort of other stuff that we didn't predict in advance, we didn't predict a global pandemic either. So, you know, as we're as we're starting looking into 2021 now, um, you know, I'd be relatively confident. <laughs> <laughs> Filling in 2021 for sure. Um, you know, I think we're kind of with the end of this kind of pandemic lockdown in sight, um, touch wood. Um, so we're assuming that that kind of all goes to plan. We, the, the, the copper pot stills, <clears throat> we need some of the engineers from the manufacturers on site and we need different things to line up to get the final furlongs done. So we're kind of trying to plan in when that happens. Do people need to quarantine as they're coming in? You know, there's just so many aspects to, uh, you know, planning in 2020 and 2021 that we're replanning the stuff that was replanned. Um, so definitely 2021, I think it's safe. It's safe to say. Um, so we will get into distillation 2021. And then, you know, the maturation is, is kind of um, an open question. We, we will tend to, uh, one of the things was we're doing all single malt um, at, the, at the site. 
big focus on peated uh, triple distilled single malt, but we also intend to do uh, batches that aren't uh, peated. Um, so we'll release we'll release batches um, with lots of kind of exploration of that peat, um, you know, uh, aspect to it. Um, <clears throat> so I think it'd be really interesting for for people. The stuff we're laying down, you know, in future will become different aspects of of peat that we're exploring in different batch releases. Um, but we also intend to do un unpeated unpeated single malt batches um, mixed in with that. And of course, they'll have different finishes, interesting, really interesting, unusual cask aspects to some of these. So they'd have to, wouldn't they? They would. They would. They'd have, they'd they'd have to, yeah, yeah. yeah will will yeah, you be, okay. so you, you have the malt loose next door then. Um, you'll be drying your, your barley over a, over a turf fire for the uh, for the peated presumably then uh, and using in the grand in, in the, is the grand dream that you'll grow your own barley you'll get the turf out of the bog locally you'll fire that peat that turf to dry out your 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 barley and yeah. you'll then use that malted barley that's been dried over a peat over a turf fire to you to to do your um for your mash that then gets distilled on site and you've got this complete mayo product yeah, absolutely. That's hundred percent the vision nicely described. You the can have that for nothing. That's free. That they're going into, and uh, age it in the wet, damp, uh, perfect climate for long aging whiskey. So you probably won't see a lot of early releases uh, from Nathan Young releases. Now we'll probably release. Um, we'll certainly release our first bottles. Um, you know, um, because we have a we have a clan who own uh, all of the first the first bottles um, already. You know, these are people who've really bought into the vision and the story from you know some of these from from day one, who have their exact number of their bottle and we keep in touch with them and we see it we see a huge amount of them. You know, people from the US coming over. You know, in normal times, obviously not 2020, but in 2019. They would, you know, some people would have planned a visit and, you know, we'd, we'd get back to them to say, you know, the distillery isn't finished yet. Um, and they'd say, we're coming anyway. We want to have a look at it <laughs> another another year then when uh, when it, it is finished, you know, and we'll kind of we'll, we'll have been there on site. So we, we take them on site, you know, um, you know, even back to the early days, um, you know, we bring them to the cooperage. Um, and then we show them around, you know, whatever stage the distillery was at, it was always kind of an open and welcoming um, tour to, to come to the distillery and we'll show you exactly how it is and that's how it is, you know, there's no, there's no way of, of, of changing that. And um, so then those, those people will get their bottles then, you know, pretty early in the development and then we intend to kind of release um small small amounts that people can kind of follow the development um without kind of saying this is our finished product because it won't be you know our kind of our finished product really uh we think will be kind of the 10 to 15 year bracket um i think is probably our sweet spot now obviously all of this is totally dependent on tasting all of this uh, along the way to see how it goes you know so we don't want to um, be too prescriptive because we don't want to kind of back ourselves into a corner of, you know, know. It'll, be, it'll be driven by taste. Um, you'll have some volunteers here now who'd be happy to taste along the way for you if you wanted. We'll, uh, would you be open to a few plane loads of Americans coming over and uh, uh, with, with, with a bit of thirst on them? Yeah, yeah. Have you got the stories on Sips Private Jet yet? <laughs> no, but we've got some private whiskies, private label whiskies. If you're maybe we'll do a, a Nathan Stories and Sips collaboration in the future. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, and we can certainly, um, anytime you want to come over, we'd be delighted to uh, bring you to the Cooperage. And uh, it's actually a lovely place to watch the guys working. If you had nothing else to do for half a day, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, as the video kind of shows, um, you know, it's it's kind of something that's very relaxing or something. There's very something very hypnotic about the, the work, you know, um, and um, I mean, certainly 
I've I've seen a good lot of it now over the years, but it's still anytime I go there, the first thing that hits you in the Cooperage is this huge smell of of oak and spirit, you know, as soon as you walk in. Um, and the Coopers, uh, the Coopers don't notice it, you see, after a while. They get so used to it that they won't notice that. Um, but you know, if you haven't been there for, you know, even a couple of days. It's the first thing, you know, the the smells and then the sounds of that kind of hammer, hammer on metals and saw going and stuff. It's um, it's just a really nice place to be. Uh, so it's a spiritual experience, I'd say, to just watch that happening. It's uh, it's something yeah. as old as time, and to to know now that there are apprentices that are now coopers and 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 have inherited this skill from their mentor and master cooper, that then they'll pass on maybe eventually. Uh, it's just a wonderful part of it. It just, I, I maintain on a regular basis that whiskey is far more than the liquid in the bottle. Like it's all these little aspects that make it so valuable to us and so interesting to us. And yeah, I, I think you'll be fairly unique in your offering then in terms of tours that even while you're waiting for the spirit to age, you've got a, a functioning cooperage to show people around. Yeah, yeah. And we've always just kind of... Um, showing people whatever whatever we have and um, whatever they wanted to to see you know uh, we don't have an official kind of tour or or anything and especially because the cooperage is like 20 minutes away from from where the distillery mm -hmm. is right now so on the distillery site we've planning permission to put in the malt house and the cooperage beside it so eventually when you get to the site um, it'll be all on the same um, on the same site um, for for people, but um, you know what we did is just uh, told them where the cooperage is. Hop in the car afterwards, maybe have a dram while we're at the cooperage talking about stuff. Uh, maybe in the winter it's it's very cold, so maybe not hang around too much there. Um, uh, but then we go over to the distillery site, and um, you know we'd we'd end up um, either in the in the in the office talking about plans of you know in the in the site office where all the all the drawings and plans are or else over in the uh in the bar across the way we've we've two lovely bars in the in the in the village uh, murphy's pub down at one end and leonard's pub up at the other end acting as lovely bookends to the village leonard's um, was mentioned earlier in the comments actually people saying they had some great nights out and even a lock-in at leonard's over the years yeah, yeah, we've been known for the odd lock in now down in Lahardon, all right. Um, so yeah, you're more than welcome to broadcast anytime uh, from Lahardon. We'll 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 set up the uh, we'll set up the Wi-Fi and infrastructure at some stage. But we'll uh, do it. We'll do it believe for sure. Not, uh, believe it or not, we've got fiber to the village, so the internet connection is good. That sounds like it was it was designed for a a live stream, a lock in live stream for us. Um, yeah, once these restrictions are lifted and the world opens up a bit and we've all been suitably and appropriately vaccinated. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be heading over on mass. Ireland won't know what hit it. There'll be such an influx of, of Americans with their, uh, with, with their checkbooks and their thirst. Yeah. And their green tour glasses. Their green tour glasses. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, everyone. Uh, yeah. For my next one ready to go, but it's not green. We'll have to get you a green tour glass so uh, so that you can uh, be part of the community. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, I, I missed it. I think it's it's gone already. Aren't they all gone? No, we still have some. We still have some. Oh, yeah, um, well, yeah. definitely have one. So yeah, we're we're on batch two now. We went through batch one. Now we moved on to batch two. We it's, okay. it's a demand. Yeah, the factory is firing them up. The yeah, um, so put in a few extra shifts. That's right. We're, they're, they're on the third shift now in, uh, in in production of the green tour glass. And long may it continue. I think um, I'm I'm very excited to see the distillery and the cooperage, and I'm absolutely fascinated by what you're doing. And I really want to thank you, Mark, for staying up first of all so late and in Ireland and sharing with us your your knowledge and your expertise and introducing us to Nathan and uh, and the tallest freestanding mountain in Ireland, uh, most importantly. But uh, the cooperage and the distillery are remarkable for their kind of authenticity and just snapshot of how it's always been done. And I think that's what's beautiful about it. And it, that's what we want to see. Uh, and, and the slow video you shared us of that kind of slow production is the thing we want. We don't want our, fa our whiskey fast tracked. We want it to take time. So it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing to see. 
Yeah, yeah. It was my wife that filmed all of that, actually. Um, so even the video, the video production, and actually all of the, um, you know, it's a small thing really in the overall s scheme of things, but uh, all of the imagery that we use, um, you know, on the packaging, um, on the website, um, even the close-up shots. Um, so that's obviously John on the packaging of the yeah. original, you know, unmistakable. But uh, even the stuff that's used on the back, um, you've got better light there, actually, Barry. The imagery that's used on the back of a close-up of a Cooper's hand with their hammer, they're John's. They're a close-up of John's hands, um, you know. So one of the things of that kind of idea of authenticity that was, you know, um, kind of important to us is that uh, we used John's actual hands on this product. Or when it comes to Nathan, we're using shots of our barley growing or we're using close-ups of our wood that um, all of the imagery and the video is kind of is is produced by us as well you know it's not kind of image um and so kind of we brought that aspect through to the kind of slow videos you know so like the youtube kind of generation maybe um you know who are expecting like uh, a 15 second overview of how to make you know what's the story with casks in 15 seconds um that's not kind of us <laughs> yeah, forget your tiktok there'll be no tiktok here <laughs> no they'll get that somewhere else the four hour long version of uh one aspect of of cask making uh that's, I love it. That, that's going to be more um what you'll be getting from us so we've actually a load of of really nice content shot um over the years and imagery and so really in terms of our communications and our, you know, all of the releases of all of this, um, it, it really comes down to kind of um, a small team um, being up the walls with all sorts of, uh, all sorts of aspects of work. Um, so, you know, as, as we kind of, uh, kind of grow, it'll allow us, it'll free us up um, just people with a little bit more time to, um, put the final touches on that sort of stuff. So you'll see more content, more nice video Great. stuff coming from us. Good. Um, Good. Like we're excited. Like we always want to do more of all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's just a time and a small time. Thing. Yeah, of course. But uh, that, that's kind of a, definitely what the style will be. Um, it'll be long. It'll be long. Pour yourself a dram and sit back and, uh, it won't be it won't be sort of action movie pace a good a good call for all of us there mark that we can take our time sit back and not rush things and maybe sip our whiskies and i'm i think we're all appreciative in ireland of uh, the uh, the billions or the hundreds of millions of dollars that are generated from people drinking shots of whiskey in america but at the same time we'd also like to balance that out a little bit with a sip and a slow slow sip and a slow think and uh, the more of those videos you put together, please share them with us so that we can pass them along because I, I love that. I love, I love that slow pace. And it's a good reminder. It doesn't have to be fast every time. Yeah. No, no. And I don't think, I don't think you'll ever see Nathan in a, in a, in a shot glass or I, I hope, I hope you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, well, one of the things we ask our guests, Mark, uh, on the show is, uh, if they have one of two things, one of these things gets more rapturous applause than the other, but it's uh, whether they have a song that they'd like to sing or whether they have a toast that they'd like to share. Uh, you're welcome to do either or both. Right. It's entirely right. up to you. I'll put, I'll put my shirt back on. What are the two things? <laughs> you could either sing a song or give us a toast. I don't know which one you'd prefer, but I know which one our mm. audience would prefer. Which, which do they prefer? They'd love an old song or an old tune. Oh, I'll give you an old song. Um, well, I've nothing. I've nothing on hand for a tune now. Um, uh, but I'll give you an song. No problem at all. Good uh, I have a thing now. Oh, I've I've got a I've got a good one now. Um, this is a Mayo story, actually. Um, I don't know how many people would be familiar with um, Knock. Um, it's not too far from us in Mayo. And uh, the Virgin Mary appeared to a group of uh, group of uh, young children <clears throat> there at one point, and um, 
uh, back back uh, in the I, I suppose seventies. Uh, I think I'd be right, early eighties. Uh, there was a, a very a very very visionary, innovative uh, Monsignor, um, and he had this idea to build a an airport, uh, which seemed like the maddest idea um, in Boglands in Mayo. And so a lot of people would have questioned um, the economics, the, you know, the sanity of building an airport um, in, in Mayo. Um, and so what I've always loved about um, this, and you can see it actually in some of the old news footage, um, there's a brilliant piece where he's talking to Pascal Sheehy, who's a, a, a reporter from RTE. And so this Monsignor who's in his robes from the church is in a windswept bog land. And the news interviewer is saying, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm building an airport. And the news reporter is like genuinely, clearly kind of bemused as to, you know, is this a real story? Is it a kind of a joke story? And there's a bulldozer going across in the background, <laughs> clearing. And he, he asked him, was he serious a good few times? <clears throat> and of course, he was deadly serious. Um, he had no funding, um, which is kind of, kind of reminiscent of how we started um, and pro progressed. Nathan, we, we, we started with the idea and made everything fall into place afterwards, you know. So um, this is a Christy Moore song anyway, about... about hey. not <laughs> <laughs> At the early age of 38, me mother sent me west. Get up, says she, and get a job, says I, I'll do me best. I pulled on me valentines to march to Kilchimak. I took a wrong turn in Charlestown and ended up in Knock. Well, once this quiet crossroads was a place of gentle prayer, where Catholics got indulgent once or twice a year. You could buy a pair of rosary beads or get your candles blessed. If you had a guilty conscience, you could get it off your chest. Then came the priest from Partry, Father Horden was his name. And since he's been a pinted knock, has never been the same. Be God, says Jim, tis 80 years since Tis time for another miracle. And he blew the candle out. Oh, from Fatima to Bethlehem, from Lourdes to Kilchimak, I've never seen a miracle like the airport up in Knock. <laughs> <clears throat> to establish terra firma, he drew up a ten-year plan and started running dances around 1961. He built a fantabulous church, me boys, upon the holy ground. And once he had a focal point, he started to expand. Chip shops and bed and breakfast sprung up overnight. Once a place, a quiet refuge, now a holy site. All sorts of fancy restaurants for every race and creed, where black and white and yellow pilgrims all could get a feed. Stalls you'd miss under canvas became religious supermarts. With such a range of godly goods, they had up 20 charts. Ah, uh, the airport opposition was destroyed by gems from card. For centenary celebrations, he brought John Paul the twenty third. Oh, from Fatima to Bethlehem, from Lourdes to Kilchimak, I've never seen a miracle like the airport up and knock. TDs were lobbied and harassed with talk of promised votes, and people who'd been loyal for years spoke a change in coats. Excommunicate. Was threatened on the flock, who said it was abortive, building airports up a knock. Now everyone is happy that the miracle is complete. Jemzer has his runway, it's 18,000 feet. All sorts of planes could land there, of that there's little doubt. It would be handy for the Yankees to keep the Russians out. Oh, did Nero donate the do, the do, did Nero donate the do, did Nero donate the do, me girl, did Nero donate the do, did Nero donate the do, me boys, did Nero donate the do. 18,000 feet of runway is an awful long way to go.
Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so, Mark, that was unreal. The uh, the crowd is going wild. Um, we've got oh. loads of cheers. Um, if if running a distillery in a cooperage isn't your uh, doesn't work out for you, you have a you have a gig as a, a Christy Moore impersonator. <laughs> I'm, working, I'm working on his clear accent as well. <laughs> it's a great tune, and I love that clip that you that you uh, you shared. I'll I'll post that in the Facebook group. Actually, it's a fantastic clip, and you describe it perfectly. I think the wind is blowing, and isn't his smock blowing up around the back of his oh, head? And he's yeah. trying to keep it down. Yeah, there's no permission yeah. or anything to be building there. No planning permission. No, doesn't doesn't have any planning permission, and uh, you know. <clears throat> just he has a determination um, that is, you know, really, really something that I suppose, uh, you know, we've we've kind of certainly latched on to that spirit of Monsignor Horan of, you know, you, you decide what you're going to do and um, little things like a planning permission and funding to build it, to build a, I was about to say, distillery, uh, to build an airport. You know, we can we can kind of cross those bridges when we get to them. Um, so it's a it's a great it's a great he didn't to see it, did he? Poor Monsignor Horn didn't live to see the opening of the airport, did he? Uh, you know, I mean, obviously this is happening when I'm uh, <laughs> pretty young. I don't. I think you could be right. Um, yeah, I think he right. passed away before the first plane landed. Sadly, I think, I think so. I think so. Yeah, um, I, mean, I think. Lots of parallels there, um, and uh, bringing in Christy Moore is uh, is always a gateway to uh, to getting some fans on board as well. Like, <laughs> I, I know there's there's no situation where uh, there isn't a Christy Moore song for it. There's a Christy Moore song for everything, and a quote for everything. Yeah, a lyric right. that goes with every aspect of life. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, if you if you want a toast for the second aspect now for for the encore, um, I I I totally uh, robbed this. <clears throat> robbed this toast and um, but we were actually shooting some we were shooting some video and there's a really interesting uh, man in the village uh, by the name of Toss Gibbons and so we actually just sh shot a load of video of just Toss talking to us and um, we've hours yeah. of footage he has a um he has a sword uh, that General Humbert used in in 1798 um, when the French landed at Kalala, it, it's a Mayo story again. But in 1798, the Irish rose up against English rule. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's it's very much associated with Wexford as well, where it was part of the, the uprising. And so the French landed a bit late to the party um, in, in County Mayo in Kalala. And they took over uh, Ballina, which was a garrison town. Um, pretty quickly and then uh, the bulk of the English forces were in Castle Bar um, which would be the county town and so they were going to march through Foxford uh, which is where Cooperage is actually incidentally and that's the main road to, to Castle Bar from Ballina but uh, again a priest actually uh, by the name of Father Conroy caught up with the French forces in Ballina and told them that the English are expecting them uh, along this route. So he would bring them out through Lahardon village um, and passed right past us. And then over Nathan uh, mountain, um, where not over the mountain itself, but there's a, there's a gap called the windy gap. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's along the Nathan route. And so he led them through what was, you know, a, a kind of a cow path, not not what you'd call a road, certainly with all the artillery um, across the Windy Gap and into Castle Bar, which was at the back of the English forces. So the English all had the experienced soldiers up front pointed towards Foxford, ready for the French and all of the very inexperienced people at the back. And so when the French and the Irish forces, which had joined up with them at that stage, <clears throat> came across the windy gap from the rear all of the inexperienced uh, soldiers turn and, and ran, of course crushed all of the english uh, forces uh, behind them pointed the right direction and so it became known as the races of castle bar that that incident and so um 
you know, a, a really interesting thing is that uh, at, at that stage they took over Castle Bar and had secured quite a quite a large piece of area, and they declared um, a Republic of Ireland. Um, sometimes you'll you'll see it as referred to as uh, Republic of Connacht, but what they actually declared was the Republic of Ireland in 1798. Um, and so it was short enough lived, um, you know, the English forces regrouped in the east and uh, moved west. And so um, the, the priest who had given the information uh, to General Humbert and the French forces to come around the other way uh, was found and was hanged um, at a public at a public hanging, and there's a, it's a nice uh, Celtic cross dedicated to him in Laherdon village, um, and so <clears throat> this is a long story anyway. But anyway, Tass Gibbons um, has who lives in the village has one of the one of General Humbert's swords um, uh, from from that time, which is an amazing piece of history just to have yeah. in his hand, you know, and he's. Um, you know, it's kind of um, it's just one of those really interesting type villages. So, so we uh, we film Tass anyway, and this toast um, is directly from Tass, <laughs> and it goes Slanchagas <laughs> Seelagat, Tawagas Rawagat, Talavgan Kisagat, Agus Poshti Gapli and on La Shahamach. And so, the translation is actually very instructive of a lot of kind of culture and thinking and history and it goes uh slanchaga sila got um health and long life uh tawagas rao got um you know uh, luck and fortune um talavgan kisa got uh land without rent to you as a toast agus posha got lena got on la shahama and one child every year from this day out Slancha. <laughs> Slancha to that. Um, for those who wish one child upon them every year, that's the perfect toast for them. Um, for those that don't, don't, don't utter that toast, lest you uh, fall under its spell. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. But uh, certainly, I mean, uh, I'm from a family. Uh, seven children you know and my mother's from a family of 13 children so that and uh the land the land without rent you know are very ingrained in in kind of irish history really they are, um, yeah yeah maybe maybe a different one. era we 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 had two kids and i can't imagine how people how people got to those sort of numbers and uh, kept their sanity <laughs> long cold winters they had plenty of whiskey, I suppose. Plenty of whiskey and poutine in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, listen, you, you've been a, an absolute legend. Um, I was chancing my arm, seeing if I could get an old song out of you, and you were only too willing and uh, more than able to, to, to agree to it and uh, to, 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 to play along. So I appreciate that, and I know everyone in the audience appreciates that, as well as the great wood and whiskey and maturation knowledge we could have gone on all night talking about wood. There's 500 more questions. We'll just have to do it all over again soon. We'll have to be back again. Absolutely. And uh, it's an open invitation for anybody uh, to come and uh, just just uh, look me up. And you're more than welcome to come and, and tour our, our cooperage or our distillery, whether it's working or not. We'll show you it uh, one way or another. And so uh, hopefully, though, by the time everything gets back to normal, restrictions lifted we'll be in distillation so we'll be drinking some of our own uh produce but uh but regardless of that uh there's always a welcome and a dram for anybody who makes it all the way to mayo and no. uh two two drams if you climb the mountain um, <laughs> three drams um, if you climb up the, the glass wall the glass the glass uh, gable <laughs> yeah and so uh, we have an invitation uh, for you to broadcast as well uh, from the village anytime you like. And uh, if not possible, we'll, we'll certainly set up a, a, live, um, a, a live view of our cooperage at some stage for you so you can see the guys work. Let's do it. Uh, that would be amazing. I could talk for hours, but, uh, you know, when you see the, the, the coopers working, um, it's, it's, it's really, 
you know, some it's it's more entertaining, I would say, than me talking about me talking well, about. Let's do that. that. Let's do that uh, at some point. You know, whenever you're 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 ready, willing, and able to do it, we'd love to have a bit of a broadcast from the Cooperage. Whatever time of day suits you, we'll make it happen. And then when restrictions open up and we're back in Ireland, we'll definitely come up and we will gladly take you up on your offer to do a live lock-in from uh, Latterdan. Uh, no, no better place. We might even get a lock-in in Leonard's pub. Uh, I can guarantee you you'll get a lock-in in, in Leonard's or Murphy's. You have your choice and uh, you can even go from lock-in to lock-in. That's hey. <laughs> and, uh, if anybody... If anybody from uh, the authorities are listening, I'm, I'm only joking. <laughs> don't, don't come check that out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they have to catch us first. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, listen, thanks a million. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, I've given the links uh, on here. Neffen Whiskey. Nathan, not Neffen. Nathan. I made the mistake twice. Uh, Nathanwhiskey.com. Uh, go check out the website. I've posted that beautiful, slow cask manufacturing, cask making process, the quarter cask uh, or the octave being made um, by, um, by John uh, is on our Facebook page on Stories and Sips and in our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. Next time we see Mark might be from a, a live Cooperage broadcast and then in person, hopefully in Mayo when the time is right. Um, but it's late in Ireland. We won't keep you up any longer, Mark. Thanks a million for joining us and thanks for the song. And the toast. Thank you, Barry. Uh, anytime at all. Anytime at all. Thank you very much. Thanks a million for joining us, Mark. We appreciate yeah. it. Slaan. All the best. Slaan. Slaan of all. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. We could have uh, gone on for another four or five hours, but uh, conscious of uh, poor Mark's time this late at night uh, and your own time as well. Uh, but, wow, well, two and a half hours there now of uh, great content from Mark. And we're very lucky to have such a uh, insights and such access to those in the profession who know far more than I could ever give you. And uh, they make the lock-in look so good and they make by connection, by association, they make me look good by coming on and giving you all such great, great knowledge and insights and a great old tune as well from Christy Moore. Lock into lock in says Johnny. That would be a, a beautiful thought, wouldn't it? We could do it. We'll have to add that to the list. We'll add that to the list. Everyone uh, with great thanks there. Uh, so thanks, Mark. Yeah, lots of great comments there. And Mark, uh, feel free to check out all the comments on Facebook that came in and on YouTube over the course of the evening as well. Kelly's excited to get her bottle of the Cooper. And I see a couple of people in the uh, in the group over the night or in the audience over the course of the evening said they placed their orders for a bottle of the Cooper as well from James Fox. So jamesfox.ie is where you can get hold of a bottle of the Cooper. 12-year-old single malt. What a wonderful story, a sad story, a tragic story. What a, a wonderful uh, commemoration and uh, tribute to John and the Master Cooper at Nathan. What a wonderful 50-year career in the world of coopering. <laughs> Jen says, there's space on the shelf over my right shoulder. I was doing a bit of a cleanup last week, no, this week, the other day, and the space is for this one, for Dark Gaelic, because that's actually what you're seeing there is the very rare shelf. Um, you're seeing, I can see there now, Barry Crockett, Middleton Very Rare 2019. The Dark Gaelic should be there. And then right next to it, James, an 18-year-old. And then if I move my head, what else is there? Oh, yeah, then we're on to the Waterfords. Oh, and the Method and Madnesses as well. Yeah, actually, that should be my busiest shelf because that's the one that's most visible. Um, the whiskey I moved on to... At the end there for the toast for John's love uh, for Mark's lovely story is Dingle Batch Five Single Malt, which is their most uh, recent release. This is the reason I chose this this evening, and we didn't get a chance to talk about its particular casks um, because we just talked about so much else, and there was only so many hours in the day. The reason I chose this is because this Dingle Single Malt has been matured in three different casks, and so it's a marriage. Um, and I'll pull out. Actually, let me pull up on the screen here. The details of it because it is actually very interesting here we go it is dingle batch number five it's a single malt abv 46.5 percent and it is a marriage of bourbon pedro jimenez and madeira cask so it is single malt whiskey that has been distilled in dingle and that single that spirit that comes out of the final still 
is then distributed amongst three different casks, uh, X bourbon, a cask, a barrel that has been that has previously contained bourbon, a barrel that has pre or a butt, a sherry butt that has previously contained Pedro Jimenez sherry from the south of Spain, from the Jerez region of Spain, and then Madeira cask, which is a fortified wine. Um, that is the spirit is also aged. And I'm losing my mind at this time of the night. Madeira is um, from the Portuguese island uh, off the coast of kind of between. Africa and Spain, uh, Portuguese island. I just couldn't couldn't gather my thoughts there and say whether Madeira was from Spain or Italy, but it's from neither. It's a Portuguese island. Um, but yeah, the spirit is matured in the three of those, and then the ratios are determined by the master distiller, uh, Graham Cool, who marries them together and gave us this Dingle single malt batch five. But I wanted to um, bring it out because of the different wood types and the different... Uh, materials or the different components and the different spirits and uh alcohols that have been in there previously i thought it was a lovely uh, a lovely addition so we've had three very different whiskies tonight the we started off or four very different whiskies we started off with the cooper uh, scotch then we moved on to method of madness french chestnut finish then we had the uh middleton very rare dark gaelic knockrath forest tree number six to talk about irish oak and then finally dingle single malt batch number five um, it is the most enjoyable of the single malts. Connor, uh, or sorry, Chris, wondering how is it? Uh, the Dingle whiskies get better with each release. Now, obviously, as they they're now what seven, eight, almost nine years old, uh, their component whiskies are getting older and older. They have more of a age stock to choose from, and you're starting to see a Dingle DNA appearing in the whiskies. The younger, earlier releases, very spirit forward, very spirit driven, as you'd imagine. But now you're starting to see the wood take over, and over the next few years, you're going to see more of that dingle DNA start to appear in that backbone. That is a very distinct flavor profile associated with a dingle single malt that over time, uh, tasting these now over the years, you'd almost be able to tell that in a blind taste test that that's clearly a dingle single malt. Johnny's looking forward to drinking dingle in dingle. I tell you what, Johnny, I'm, I'm right there with you. I am right there with you. Martin says... Is it weird that I'm not a wine drinker, but I really like wine finished whiskey? I'm exactly the same. I don't drink wine typically, but I love fortified wine finished whiskies. Madeira, Marsala, Sherry. Um, what else? Yeah, um, Malaga. Love a rich, fortified, sweet wine finished whiskey. Greg said the same. And let me see. Da -da -da -da. Another drink to John. Laura Barry still hanging in there. Great to see you, Laura. Class night. Nathan is now definitely on the bucket list. Yeah, same. And uh, that's the joy of this uh, little little job I have here on a Friday night is uh, educating myself and piquing my own curiosity about what's happening in the world of Irish whiskey. I didn't know a lot about Nathan prior to tonight. And uh, there's occasionally a guest where I don't have a whole lot of knowledge about them, but Mark was... Mark reached out to me a few weeks ago and said, look, we've got a, an inter interesting story here around the passing of John and we've released this whiskey and can I send you a bottle and I'd like to talk to you about it. And I said, that sounds like exactly the kind of thing that you should be sharing with the lock-in. So don't tell me anything about it. I don't want to know. We'll wait till the lock-in and then you can share it live. And he, he was very graciously accepted and said he'd stay up this late at night to share the stories and be richer for his storytelling and his sharing. And the old song at the end didn't hurt either. Uh, port finished. Oh yes, Dave says, don't forget port finished. How could I forget port finished? We had a great uh, flurry of excitement in our Facebook group today, didn't we, Dave, about a port finished whiskey? And that was the uh, Red Breast 30 year old. So I woke up this morning to a, a post on our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. Don O'Connor posted, he said, uh, almost like a public service announcement. Wait till you hear this one. He said, just want to let you all know, he said, form an orderly queue. There are now only 25 bottles left of the Red Breast Whiskey Exchange exclusive 30-year-old uh, single cask, all port, which is a, by the time you factor in delivery charges and et cetera, it's, a, it's an $850 bottle of whiskey. And he said, there's only 25 bottles left. He said, um, you know, get them while you can. Well, within two or three hours, they were down to what, 18 or 19 bottles at the Whiskey Exchange because so many of you, jumped on the chance to uh to get hold of a let's just say a, a, a 
more than a car payment, a mortgage size, uh, mortgage payment equivalent bottle of whiskey. But it is a port finish whiskey and it's extraordinary. It's on my shelf back here. I've almost finished my bottle. Um, there may or may not be another one in standby because look, life is short and you have to, you have to do what you can to support the distilleries, you know. But uh, yeah, there was a flurry of excitement around the port. Uh, and I think if you go into the Facebook group, you'll see the conversations around it. Very rare that you get hold of a 30 year old all port single cask only 444 bottles ever ever released <laughs> um there was also another great story today that i wanted to share with you and laura barry if you're still on you'll enjoy this because it's a cork story and let me see if i can find this here now and this was shared in our group as well and it was shared by michael cowman who we've had on here who is the representative of paddy irish whiskey Great brand ambassador. You know him for having the big red beard. He's been on here a few times. We'll have him back again. But uh, Michael works for Paddy Irish Whiskey. And Paddy is a historic Irish whiskey brand. And it's a it's a, a renowned cork brand. It is a brand that goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, it was originally called the Cork Distilleries Company's um, Map of Ireland Irish Whiskey. Um, it is today called Paddy in honor of Paddy O'Flaherty, uh, who was the brand representative, the man who went around the streets of and, and towns and byways and highways of Cork and um, Munster back in the early 1900s. And when Paddy retired uh, in the early 1900, 1912, 1913, um, the Cork Distilleries Company, which was the um, the, the forerunner to what became Irish Distillers and Cork Distilleries Company owned the Middleton Distillery and they owned other distilleries in Cork too, the Watercourse Road Distillery where Paddy would have been made. Um, they named it in his honour, Paddy Irish Whiskey. But Paddy was, has, a, has a really great Irish history, uh, uh, Irish whiskey history and also a good Cork history and there's great Cork stories that go with Paddy and many Cork homes would have had a bottle of Paddy in their, in their house. But Michael shared the story that just before Christmas, an old man in the UK um, sent him a note uh, uh, talking about Paddy and, and, and his love for Paddy Irish whiskey and Michael put together a little care package, sent it to him and he wrote a lovely thank you note back but he also included a little story uh, included with his uh, with his thank you note and I'll read it out to you because it's, uh, it's, it's quite tough to read on screen if I shared it with you. It's a lovely, lovely story. Let me pull it up here. It's uh, up on the top of the page. It says, short story that might amuse you. In 1961, I worked as a waiter at the Imperial Hotel in Cork City um, at most of the big function dinners. The guest of honor uh, was Jack Lynch. He was the local retired sporting hero. And at that time, he was the, he was the, uh, the Minister of Industry and Commerce. He later became the Taoiseach or the Prime Minister of Ireland. And for those of you who are familiar with Ireland and Cork, you'll know the Imperial Hotel on, uh, on, the, on the South Mall in Cork has a great, rich history uh, tied to many historical aspects of Irish history, Cork history, like Michael Collins. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, for some reason, I was always trusted to look after Jack Lynch at dinner and to keep his wine glass full. But his wine was poured from a bottle of paddy wrapped in a large napkin. I never saw him add water, and by the end of the evening, the bottle was empty. At the end of every meal, he always sought me out to thank me for looking after his wine. Most evenings, he also gave me a cigar. I never had the heart to tell him I didn't smoke, but it did make, my, uh, it did make me very popular with the restaurant manager who loved cigars. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely Cork story? Uh, Jack Lynch... Uh, is a Cork hero, a Cork legend. He was a hurling legend in Cork, as, as all Ireland final medals from from Cork, all Ireland medals for Cork. He would have played with his uh, his good friend Christy Ring, and uh, th those two fellows would have uh, would have been Cork legends. Uh, today, uh, Jack Lynch is is immortalised with a tunnel uh, that goes under the River Lee, the Jack Lynch Tunnel. But back in the day, Jack Lynch, of course. Uh, a big part of Irish history, Cork history, sporting history in Ireland. But a lovely story to go with Paddy Whiskey. I thought I'd share that with you. From the Imperial Hotel. Yeah, the Imperial Hotel is a, uh, my understand. I think that Michael Collins spent his last night on earth in the Imperial Hotel, if I recall correctly. If you walk into the lobby of the Imperial Hotel, you'll see a big portrait of Michael Collins hanging opposite the concierge desk. Great spot for you know, gin and tonic too, and a whiskey, and a good pint of Guinness as well. And a footballer as well. 
Yeah, that was a great story. <laughs> Laura says, I know what you're going to tell. It's a class one, isn't it? Great story altogether. So thanks to Michael for sharing that. It's in our Facebook group too. He put, he put, he took a picture of the uh, of the little note. I think that's lovely. All righty. So let me see. I think we're almost at the end of our lock-in. <laughs> um, you know, these things don't happen in not Cork. No, all the best stories happen in Cork. Laura knows that. Uh, we got a great... Uh, sharing of a Christy Moore song there, didn't we? And uh, we have, of course, in the past, shared Chris, other Christy Moore songs, but maybe tonight we'll go out with another Christy Moore song. It's uh, it's fitting. Uh, Laura's a big fan of Christy Moore. I'm a big fan of Christy Moore. And the fact that Mark was so nice to share a great song, the Knock song with us, a legendary song. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll play out tonight with a, with a Christy Moore song as well. But that clip that Mark shared uh, that talked about uh, that news clip from the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s of the reporter interviewing the Monsignor in the, the dirt that eventually became a runway. I'll share that in our Facebook group as well with the backstory to it so that you can uh, so that you can watch that clip. It's a great clip on RTE. All right, so uh, I'm going to sing you out with, uh, with a Christy Moore song, maybe one of my favourite Christy Moore songs, and it is uh, called Black is the Colour, uh, a beautiful song, Black is the Colour uh, with Christy Moore. But I need a glass in my hand, don't I? All right, here's my whiskey. I'm sure you know this song. Laura says, Christy Moore has a live stream on the 1st of May. He does. He was supposed to have it earlier, wasn't he? I had my tickets um, for it earlier, and it's been rescheduled. But yes, I have my ticket. Laura, we might do a, we might do a little, um, um, what would you call it, a watch party uh, on our Facebook group or on a Facebook page when Christy plays on the May 1st. So we will check that out. So uh, until I see you all again next week, we'll have a great show next week. Maybe bring on some uh, musicians next week as well. Until then, we'll sing an old uh, Christy Moore song, Black is the Colour. Slaunch. Black is the colour of my true love's hair. Her lips are like some roses fair. She has the sweetest smile and the gentlest hands. I love the ground whereon she stands. I love my love and well she knows. I love the ground whereon she goes. I wish the day it soon would come. When she and I could be as one. I go to the Clyde, I mourn and weep. For satisfied I ne'er can be. I write her a letter, just a few short lines. And suffer death a thousand times. For black is the colour of my true love's hair. Her lips are like some roses fair. She has the sweetest smile and the gentlest hands. And I love the ground whereon she stands black is the color by christy moore slaunch everybody thanks for joining me a great night again thanks for joining along singing along sipping along we'll do this all again next week slaunch everybody really appreciate you all being here and uh, tell your friends about us we'll have more music and great guests next week slaunch have a safe weekend wash your hands stay safe stay indoors slaunch